uh, call this a uh, hearing of the Spokane Plan Commission for May 10th? May 11th. 11th, 11th. thank you, 2022. Um, we have uh, two main uh, hearings tonight, and the second one has two or three parts, so we're going to do our best. Um, but we'll start uh, with uh, roll call, please. Sorry, Jackie. All right, uh, Michael Baker, he is absent today. Jesse Bank. Here. Todd Byrother. Here. Greg Francis. Here. Chris Neely. Looks like Commissioner Neely may not be back quite yet, but he was here earlier. Ryan Patterson. Here. Uh, Commissioner Shook is also absent today. Tim Williams. Here. Clifford Winger. Present. So we do have a quorum. And Mary Winkus? Here. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to start by reading the um, best I can here some of our rules tonight since we will, uh, each, each hearing item, we will have um, a presentation by staff and then we will open um, and have oral testimony if anyone would like to join us uh, in person or online. And then we'll close the testimony, and then that, that is an opportunity for the, the commission to make a motion and then um, and deliberate the, the, the item to take action. Uh, so I'm just going to do a, a, brief, um, a brief overview of, of our rules for public hearings here. Um, everyone has the right to speak at a public hearing pertaining to the hearing topic for a limited amount of time, and we'll, we'll put that at three minutes tonight. Uh, and you're also allowed to submit written testimony and exhibits prior to the public hearing and also at the public hearing. Uh, no on, on that note, um, if when we close the, the testimony, uh, the public record for the commission, you're still allowed to submit and that will be then forwarded to the, to the council level if it moves forward. Um, as part of that, uh, I think the only other general rule is that um, please, uh, we follow Robert's rules, please wait to be um, called upon to speak. We'll be very organized when we, as, as the commission, but also um, the commission has the opportunity to ask questions of someone who's testifying, uh, or once we move into deliberation, we can, the, the commission has the ability to uh, ask uh, staff or the proponent for, for questions. Uh, we won't take no, no, no more uh, testimony at that point. Okay, that was brief, but uh, I, I think that's sufficient for now. So let's start with our first item. Um, hearing um, number one is the six-year comprehensive street program with uh, Mr. Kevin Pecan... I'm sorry. <laughs> You're going to have to help me. Pecan Picanto. Picanto. <laughs> no. Good afternoon, Planning Commission. I'm Kevin Picanso from Integrated Capital Management, uh, presenting today on our update to our 2023 through 2028 comprehensive street program. First up, just a kind of agenda of, of topics we'll be going through. I'll, I'll touch briefly upon uh, the public hearing process as it relates to, to this matter today. Um, included in your packet for our six-year streets update, was our comp plan goals consistency review matrix, which I'll touch on later, um, and just general information. The overall program is available online in draft form uh, to review as well. Uh, the focus today will be an overview of our new projects, as well as the comp plan consistency review for those new projects, uh, leading to a requested action today of um, recommendation to council for, for acceptance of uh, the new project projects going into the program. Just big picture overview on schedule and where we are today. Uh, we've had multiple touch points with Plan Commission in the past. An uh, early update as introduction to the Plan Commission in February. Um, multiple touch points with both City Council, PCTS, as well as uh, before the Council at Pies. Um, last at last month's uh, Plan Commission meeting, about about a month ago, we had the review workshop um, on this same topic. Uh, the content of my presentation today will be uh, very similar. 
uh, to that, no, no real changes. And then uh, in June, we have two touch points with council leading ultimately to a uh, request for approval of the overall street program update. Again, on the hearing purpose, uh, really the focus is on the review of the new projects going into the program. People on WebEx can't hear, so I think this computer is muted and we have to unmute it. There, you want to drive? There we go. Can you hear now on WebEx? Chris, Commissioner Neely, can you hear? Oh, Michelle said. this again there again um, our our focus today is really on a review of the new projects going into the the street program for 23 through 28 um, in terms of their consistency with the with the comprehensive plan existing projects already in the program that are continuing forward have already been vetted through the same process in past years as new projects entering the program and adopted by council uh, in previous update cycles and again, this is a reference just to our municipal code section that, that speaks to this, uh, this process of, of uh, working through the plan commission on our capital programs. Just as a kind of introduction update, I always show this graphic and it's just a, just a reminder again that um, the role of our six-year program is really our, our mechanism to ad adopt and, and uh, seek to achieve the goals of the transportation chapter of our comprehensive plan. Once projects are included in our six-year program, uh, we can seek funding and then move forward ultimately through design and then construction of the projects. Uh, each year, we're required um, by state law to have an approved or adopted program prior to July 1st. That's different and unique uh, from the other capital programs uh, that we develop for utilities and parks, et cetera, uh, it's specific to the transportation. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of here uh, ahead of our overall capital improvement process for other elements in the city. And each year is where we uh, do those uh, changes to the program, including the new projects coming in and uh, addressing other changes as well. Uh, quickly, before I launch into the new projects, just a quick summary of the projects coming out of the program. Most of these projects have either been uh, completed in construction this past year or are currently uh, under construction, such as the North River Drive sidewalk, if you've been out that way, um, which is on uh, just east of Washington Street. That's under construction as we speak, as well as the Greener Mina traffic signal. Uh, those projects will be completed here in the next couple of months and thus don't need to be carried forward into the 23 through 28 program. Just a quick overview of a, a map of a location of all the new projects going into the program. We have a large number of projects uh, in the northeast portion of the city, a fair number in the downtown core as well, and then a couple projects each in the northwest and, and to the south. And I'll elaborate on each of these projects as I did last time. Uh, in terms of the kind of the source or reason some of these projects are going in, of the 15 new projects, 13 of them are a result of successful grant awards that have occurred over the past year. So quickly kind of kind of list the source for some of these. Uh, we had two Safe Routes to School grants uh, that we received in the past year. And again, I'll elaborate on each of these projects as I, as I go forward here. Uh, Ped Bike Safety Program through the state. Uh, we had a grant award there for Green Carlisle. Then two large projects through the NHS Asset Management, which is focused on roadway street preservation type work. We had two large uh, bridge grants as well. Uh, a smaller grant for a TIB sidewalk uh, infill project on Haven Street. Uh, two additional street preservation projects uh, through SRTC as well. And then moving in um, to some, kind of some newer ones that um, occurred here in the last couple months. First, the Move Ahead Washington uh, funding that was approved by the state legislature uh, a couple months ago. There are two, uh, two projects funded for um, new greenway projects. And then through the state supplemental budget process, there was also some money earmarked for a study on in Inland Empire Way. 
And then the two locally funded projects are Illinois Avenue, which is a grind and overlay and protected, uh, protected or shared use path project. And then a, a study that uh, we're gonna be performing on Pacific Avenue as well. And there are no additional new projects uh, being added to the program this year from our reconstruction matrix or rebuild matrix. That topic of the rebuild matrix uh, you know, comes up every year and, and there's usually some discussion around it at the PCTS or plan commission or council. There are no new projects uh, going into the program this year. And those are our, our larger full rebuild type projects. And that just relates to, um, to funding constraints or the fact we haven't hit on grants in the past year for those types of projects. So I'm going to go, go through the list of projects. This list uh, um, is included and available to you. Um, I'm not going to read all the detail on here. I'll kind of do that with each of the projects as I move through them. Uh, first up, uh, and, and this content is similar to what I presented last time, I will, will mention that I did add a little bit more information here uh, for this presentation, just providing some funding information, whether or not there's grant funding or not and how much, and an initial a uh, cut of when or thought of when the construction would occur on these particular projects. So this first project is a Maple Street bridge deck repair as a result of a successful grant award. Uh, this project will remove the rutting that's occurred on the, on the existing deck and install a thin concrete um, overlay to improve that surfa in surface and uh, prevent additional damage to the bridge which could lead to much more costly repairs down the road. Next project is also uh, from that same grant program, the local bridge program. The three projects, or three bridges highlighted here through Riverfront Park um, on Washington and Stevens. Um, if you've driven that corridor, you know that there's an, a thin asphalt layer that is in very poor shape and has been a constant maintenance problem for many years now. Uh, this work will remove all that asphalt layer, perform some bridge deck and joint repair, and put back a different surface, most likely, a modified concrete surface similar to what we'll do on the Maple Street Bridge project. And that, that improvement, we hope, will be a more durable surface and won't have the repeated um, problems that we've uh, observed out there for many years. Next project is a bike ped project through the um, bike ped safety program through the state. This project will include uh, the installation of a pedestrian hybrid beacon at the Green Carlisle intersection. Uh, Green Street, of course, is a very high traffic, fairly high speed uh, corridor, four lanes of travel, difficult location for pedestrians to cross, uh, but is a critical point. Um, there's transit stops on each side and is a key, um, key crossing point to be able to uh, go from one neighborhood to the other on, on each side of the roadway there. The project will also include a, a shared use path on the north side of Carlisle Avenue that will connect to the future Children of the Sun Trail and this project also installs sidewalk on each side of Carlisle from Ralph Street to three blocks to the east to Freya Street, and that sidewalk on each side of the roadway. Some of the other improvements shown in this graphic are related to the NSC and will be constructed by WashDOT, and we're in close coordination with them as the two projects uh, clearly tie together and, and overlap each other uh, in some locations. Next project is a Safe Rouse School Grant Award, also for a pedestrian hybrid beacon on Nevada. Uh, this is adjacent to N Nevada Park and then Gary Middle School to the west. Again, provide a hybrid beacon and, and pedestrian and crossing improvements and improve that safety for pedestrians wishing to access both the park or the school. Next project is also a Safe Rouse School funded project. This project will install a sidewalk on each side of Liberty Avenue from roughly Crestline to Cook Street to the east. We'll also install an RRFB at the Crestline Cortland intersection there to the northwest. Next project is a Haven Street sidewalk infill. So it's a small infill project of install, installation of new sidewalk on the west side of Haven Street within the Haven Market Couplet and Hilliard. Um, this is a transit route, uh, so it'll improve access to transit as well as just general pedestrian circulation um, in this area. Next project is a study for the Pacific Avenue Greenway. I'll speak to another uh, phase, if you will, of Pacific Avenue Greenway west of Sherman Street, but this particular project will be a study to uh, examine continuation of that work east of Sherman Street over to Sprague Way and looking at ways to connect down to Sprague Avenue itself 
and further connections down to the Binbur Trail. Next project is one of those NHS asset management projects. This is a large street preservation project for grind and overlay work. There's three different locations packaged uh, within this particular grant on, on Market and Green Street in Hilliard, a uh, segment of 29th Avenue on the South Hill, and then a segment of Monroe Street as well. Next project is a second grant award from that same NHS asset management program. This is a little bit lar larger package of work. As a segment of work up on Lincoln Road, Standards in Nevada. A second segment on 29th Avenue on the South Hill, small segment of uh, Washington Street, um, just north of the river, and then a second segment of Monroe Street from Wellesley to Francis. Next project is also a street preservation project funded through SRTC's uh, Street Preservation Grant Program, federally funded project. This project will do grind and overlay work on Haven Street as part of the Haven Market Couplet. Uh, we may merge this project with the sidewalk work I mentioned a little bit earlier uh, and plan for most likely 23 construction on both of those. Next project is also through the SRTC Street Preservation Grant Program. This is chip seal work for the Maple Ash Couplet from Northwest Boulevard north to Rowan Avenue. As part of this project, we'll also look to um, install striped bike lanes as well uh, for this stretch of road. Next project is Illinois Avenue. Um, a few of you may have been involved in some of the public outreach we did on this project, or maybe seen some other presentations through council and otherwise. Um, this project is a result of a planning effort we performed last year. We had some uh, a grind and overlay work planned for this corridor. Um, we, we sort of paused that work and did a more in-depth study and the end result is we're doing both the grind and overlay work, that traditional street maintenance uh, that our street department would normally do, but we're also reconfiguring the roadway, which will allow for a shared use path along the bluff side of Illinois Avenue, from roughly Perry Street to roughly Market Street. We'll install uh, three to four enhanced ped crossings as well, so the neighborhood, adjacent neighborhood can access that shared use path. And we're also planning on installing two overlooks or plazas at the westerly and easterly ends of the project. Got a couple other slides of that. We can come back to that if folks have uh, more questions on this project that they, that they uh, have. Uh, this is a rendering of, of what a uh, plaza or overlook may look like at uh, one of these locations. Moving on to the next project, the Pacific Avenue Greenway. This is for construction. So this is west of Sherman, so Howard to Sherman. This is a result of the Move Ahead Washington funding. Uh, there's still some question marks in terms of the timing of when that funding will become available. Uh, so that construction timeline is still to be determined. But this would uh, install a green, greenway type improvements from Howard following the Pacific Avenue route as it jogs there kind of west of Brown, crosses Brown and Division. And this first phase at least would, would terminate at Sherman. There be, this, this work includes new traffic signals at the crossings of Brown and Division. It's been a real safety challenge and problem at that location, been a lot of uh, pedestrian accidents uh, at those two locations. So installation of the traffic signal will, will provide a you know, controlled intersection for safer ped crossings. And then more traditional greenway type improvements, um, wayfinding, improvements of sidewalk where needed, ADA ramps, et cetera, along the rest of the corridor. And then again, I men mentioned earlier, we then have kind of the next phase in terms of that study we'll look at, which would extend this work east of Sherman in the future. And these are just blow-ups that uh, kind of show some concept drawings of enhancements at both Brown and Division in terms of those traffic signals and enhanced pedestrian crossings. The next project is also uh, another project funded through that Move Ahead Washington uh, um, action by the state. Um, this is a Cook Street Greenway project. There's been a variety of improvements that have been installed along this planned greenway. So this, this project would sort of fill the gaps, if you will, and complete the remainder of improvements. Probably mostly be focused on uh, pedestrian hybrid beacon or RFB type uh, crossing improvements at our trailer roadways along the corridor. And then finally, this is um, in the Empire Way study, again, funded through um, a state uh, legislative action here recently, provided funding to do a study in cooperation with WashDOT to look at an Inland Empire Way. The 195 corridor study that SRTC just recently completed, 
identified a connection or a reconnection to Inland Empire Way, essentially opening that back up to traffic. At one time it was connected to 195, opening that up as an alternative route. So this study will take a little deeper look on Inland Empire Way itself and determine, you know, are there impacts in the Empire Way? Do we need, need to consider bike and pedestrian and type improvements or crossing improvements, since there would be some increase in traffic along the corridor as a result of that opening? We'll also look at just the implementation and phasing of, of when it makes sense to do that uh, work and how there's, there's uh, two phases of improvements in terms of that connection that are contemplated. Um, so, so we'll examine that a little bit more in terms of an implementation plan uh, for those improvements in terms of that connection to the Inland Empire Way. So I'll pause there for a second in case there's any questions on the particular projects. Um, I'll, I can jump next into the uh, consistency review in terms of the comp plan, but I wanted to pause in case there was any project-specific type questions I could answer. Thank you, Greg. Um, I guess this isn't specific to a project, but I'm wondering you know, you've put dollar values to this because I know they have to be funded to go into the program, correct? Yes. So what happens, you know, we've had a lot of inflationary impact and, you know, some of these are several years out from occurring. What happens if we can't fund them? Sure. Um, you, you know, you're completely accurate. We are in a challenging environment right now that's, that's um, really dynamic you know, in terms of identifying appropriate costs. Uh, I'll answer that by saying we, we try to be pretty conservative in our upfront estimates when we submit these applications, so we aren't caught short in terms of funding. I'll also add that um, not all of the grants, but many of them are actually 100% funded, which is uncommon, but is becoming more common, I would say. A few of the Safe Routes to School, um, one of the local bridge grants, for instance, were 100% funded, and there's no guarantees, but we've been fairly successful at going back to the awarding agencies if we're seeing cost escalation or cost increases, particularly on our bridge projects as an example. M many of you know there's a hatch bridge project going, going on right now under construction. We're able to see, receive a little bit more funding on that project as an example. So there is that opportunity to go back. This is a topic that I've encouraged, um, I'm on the SRTC TTC committee. I've encouraged more discussion on this topic, just because it's gonna be a challenge for all agencies, and hoping that um, the granting agencies, washed out local programs, those types of folks will, will be thinking ahead on it and um, maybe providing more flexibility for us to be able to address it. In other cases, that match, if we do have a match on a project, it, it may be small enough that even if it's increased, because it's typically a 13.5%, sometimes it's 20%, even if that increases a fair amount, it's still a small number because it's, again, a, you know, again that 13.5 to 20% that we have to then bump up some versus the entirety of a project. So um, no guarantees, but I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to kind of weather you know, some of those cost increases that may occur. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, any, anyone else? And Commissioner Neely is online. I, I'm watching for, for a hand if you want to be recognized, so thank you. Commissioner Winger. Uh, on the uh, 195 study, is the uh, Neighborhood Council going to be included uh, as they do that study? Because the SRTC uh, papers uh, cause quite a stir in that neighborhood. Yes, there'll definitely be a public outreach effort as part of that study, including you know specific outreach to the neighborhood. Yeah. Neighborhood or neighborhood council? Neighbor, well, both. I would okay. say both. Yeah. Okay. Just getting clear. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, um, in, in terms of the uh, kind of review of the projects as they relate to consistency with the comp plan, um, I provided this matrix, the same as uh, what we provided last time. No changes. Just. I don't intend to go through each project and each comprehensive plan goal, but it just kind of generally kind of relay what I do each year is, is I just look at each of those comp plan goals, and I um, and if folks are interested, I have kind of snippets of each of those. So I, I kind of reread and review each of them, and then I look over each project and I and I make my determination of of whether they sort of check the box or address some of those goals. You're never going to have a single project that addresses all. 23 of these goals, just because of the diversity of what those goals are 
that's highly unlikely. Um, so I would say this is you know pretty normal um, in, in terms of the number of goals that each of these projects address. So that's the process I go through each year. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there's any specific questions on you know why why I checked a certain box. Okay, thank you, Mr. Okay, Gonzo. So I any, any questions? I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, seeing none. So I think with that, the next step in the process, I'll turn it back um, to you, Commissioner, okay. in terms of uh, if there's public comment, okay. and then again requesting that requested action. Uh, if you mentioned, I'm, I'm sorry, did, do you have a summary of the written testimony, or just characterize it? Jackie, is the, I, has there been any written testimony submitted? Yeah, okay. I have not seen any. Perfect, thank you. Uh, one thing I didn't, thank you for that. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in the hearing rules is if you're here in person, so we, we're testifying, we can t you can testify both online and in person. If you're in person, please um, come to the table up front here and, and sign in with one of these forms. But since I didn't mention it before, is anyone in person here who would like to testify on this matter? Um, just to click, no, no. Just, just to clarify, I have four names currently for the next hearing. Um, Ms. Dirks, Mr. Brake, Mr. Watkins and Ms. Pappas, I believe, and those are all for the housing hearing, correct? Okay. Anyone online like to be recognized? Just please raise your hand or, Mr. Watkins, are you, are you, do you wanna be recognized on this hearing item also? Okay, yeah, please go ahead. Well, is this a portion of the hearing for testimony? This is the testimony on the on the transportation portion, not the not the any of the housing elements, not the ADU or. No, no, I signed up for the uh, the other portion. My thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing or hearing none, um, we will close the the public record on on this hearing item, and then we can entertain a motion. All right. I move to recommend that City Council adopt the 2023 to 2028 six year comprehensive street program as written and presented. Second. Okay, thank you, um, Commissioner Francis. Commissioner Winger, uh, any deliberation on this item by the commissioners? Okay, well done. Okay, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll take roll call, please. All right, Jesse Bank. Aye. Todd Byrother. Aye. Greg Francis. Aye. Chris Neely. Commissioner Neely. Hmm. I see you. Okay, we'll come back to him. Uh, Ryan Patterson. Aye. Tim Williams. Aye. Clifford Winger. Aye. All right, Commissioner Neely, can you hear us? What is your vote? I don't know if he hears us, but the motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, we'll move into the second uh, hearing item, and I'll like to introduce uh, Mr. Nate Gwynn and Ms. Amanda Beck, although I'm going to take a point of personal privilege on behalf of the commission to recognize Mr. Gwynn for his years of service with this planning department and um, and uh, maybe let's are you willing to make a quick little announcement and, and inform the commission of your plans yeah sure Th thank you commission president uh, I am Nathan Gwynn city's a planning department uh, today's my last day with the city of Spokane I'm uh, returning to school um, in later this month at uh, Gonzaga Law so be sticking around in town and um, it's really been a pleasure working with uh, my colleagues who have, have been so instrumental in all, in all the work that we do here um, and uh, the team working to to bring you uh, you know these co uh, code amendments and uh, working with you um, you know behind the scenes and it's been a pleasure to serve you the last eight years, so thank you very much. Well, well said, sorry, not sorry, but thank you for, for raising this question. I just wanna um, say how grateful we are, and um, I have to say, 
as someone who's been here for a while, how, how much I've learned from, from working with you and, and just how, how appreciative of how organized and thoughtful on, on, on every matter that I've, we've been able to work with, with you. So, Commissioner Francis. I just want to say, Nathan, I, I really appreciate the time with you. I've, I think I've worked with you for seven and a half years or so. And so I, I've learned a lot from you and I enjoyed our road trips together. And Likewise. so I wish you the best. <laughs> We know you'll, we'll see you around, so. Okay, well thank you for, thank you. for entertaining that. Um, with that, we will now turn it over to uh, Mr. Gwynn and Ms. Beck. Good evening, Plan Commission. Um, so as Nate said, we will be talking tonight about the draft code before you for accessory dwelling units, lot size transition, and short plat notification. Um, so some of this will be a repeat for all of you as we have had 10 different workshops on these items and the other code amendments that we're doing for shaping Spokane housing, but for members of the public, we wanna give some background. So the code amendments that we are working on currently under shaping Spokane housing are really grounded in the comprehensive plan, which forms the backbone for this, particularly the chapters on land use and housing Several of the goals and policies within those chapters have directed what sections of code we chose to look at. And then also the housing action plan, obviously that is full of direct actions that the city is recommended and its partners are recommended in taking to encourage and help incentivize construction of more housing. Additionally, the two other documents would be city council's implementation plan, which had additional steps in addition to what was included in the housing action plan and then the mayor's um, emergency proclamation. So we wanted to make sure that the sections of code that were chosen did not just operate alone. We wanted to see how they functioned as a whole suite working together. So one of the things that we did working with our consultant makers is to give them test lots throughout the city that represented different development patterns, different lot sizes, different age of housing stock because as we have gone through the decades, the size of housing has changed over the years. And so we wanted to see if we make changes to accessory dwelling unit regulations, if we make changes to lot size transition, how would that work in concert with all of the other pieces? And so we used that uh, to test how these things worked out. And that definitely impacted how we have refined the draft as we've gone through workshops with Plan Commission. So excuse how much text is on this slide. We wanted to be um, as brief as we could to get to the real meat and potatoes of this, which is talking about the code itself. But it does bear standing to highlight that we have tried to do public engagement throughout this process. We started back in November talking about the different code sections and then kicked off as early as we could with actual engagement in the community. Through the various actual outreach events that we have done, we have reached about 375 people, most of whom were in person actually, which I think is great. We did have two online events and had really great discussion during each of those. And that has helped inform um, what we have tried to tweak in the draft. And also it has given us a good temperature gauge on the way that the community feels about this. Obviously housing is a very top of mind um, discussion right now in our community. So that being said, comments are still being accepted. Uh, the most up-to-date comments that we received were handed out to you at the dais, and we will include those in the packet that do, that do go to Plain Commission, or excuse me, City Council. So anything that's received after today will be forwarded on to Plain Commission. Um, we can include you, but it would be in the packet for City Council moving forward. So to, to kind of orient what we're talking about today, we will discuss accessory dwelling units first, and then we'll go on to lot size transition and finally wrap up with short plat notification. Um, we will discuss each of these items. It has its own slide and some accompanying graphics, but I just wanted to highlight everything that we're talking about on screen. There are eight different kind of sections, if you will, in regard to ADUs. Um, so we are talking about that secondary unit on a lot, so not the primary home, but 
what some people call a mother-in-law suite or a Langway house. They kind of all go by different names depending on where you are. Some places call them casita. But so we're talking about a secondary accessory unit on the lot. Um, when we talk about them, ADUs come in all kinds of flavors like donuts. There are a lot of great varieties. We've got the detached. We have detached above garage. We also allow for internal, so you can do it in a basement. You can do, um, now with our code changes, we're proposing doing it in an attic space. You can do it in an attached breezeway, so it's not exactly attached to the house. It's slightly separated. So there's a lot of variety. They are allowed within all of our existing zoning districts and we'll talk about what the existing standards are first to kind of set the stage for how we're changing the code. Thanks, Amanda. And so uh, kind of looking at the ground level of, of what's currently allowed for detached accessory dwelling units, that's 600 square feet under the city's development code. And so that's the building shown here in the foreground that's built on the same lot as the primary home. And then shown here is a 20 foot height uh, to the tallest part of the roof if not built over an accessory structure. And then the next slide shows the proposed change to that size from 600 square feet to 864 square feet to allow uh, increased floor area for accommodating a two bedroom, two bath, uh, and full kitchen in, if, if desired. And that, again, encourages and incentivizes the production of housing as envisioned in the housing action plan and, uh, and as encouraged by the housing action plan and related documents. So um, looking next um, at the uh, some other bulk and size controls. Uh, so the models by the consultant makers showed a 15% building coverage um, that and that typically works for the accessory structure, so that's kind of what's reflected here, except on some smaller lots. And these bulk and size controls are reflective of the changes that are proposed for the residential single family and residential two family zones. Um, they do, the accessory structures do, do get more coverage in the higher density zones. So to allow flexibility on some smaller lots with an accessory dwelling unit, an adjustment is proposed to uh, for those lower density examples to allow up to 20% coverage on the, on the lot. And this is a modest increase, of, there's also a related modest increase to floor area ratio, and that's combined for the, uh, both the accessory dwelling unit and the main residence um, to allow for additional floor area ratio on some of those smaller lot sizes. Uh, again, that was uh, recommended by the consultant. So uh, kind of looking at, um, the examples of building coverage and floor area ratio and what those mean. Um, these diagrams show more to less coverage moving from left to right. And so the top row sh shows a floor area ratio of 0 0.5 and different positions uh, of that floor area on the lot based on the number of stories. And then uh, that top row is consistent with the amount of floor area ratio for those residential single family and residential two family zones. Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, it's not limited in the residential multifamily or residential high density zones. Those are higher density zones that uh, don't limit the floor area ratio, but the building coverage limits still apply in those, in those cases. And then, uh, of course, the bottom row shows the floor area ratio of uh, 1.0. Typically, um, we're looking at closer to 50% for that building coverage for the total building coverage on the site. Um, and then for wall height and roof height change over a garage, uh, currently the wall height is 16 feet. That would be raised to 17 feet. And so this is a, uh, not, the, not the instance of the, just the single story accessory dwelling unit, but actually over, built over a garage. Um, so raised to 17 feet at the low wall. And then the highest point of the roof, that would be 23 feet currently raised to 25 feet for that, uh, the highest portion of the wall. And that in the roof, highest portion of the roof, um, and the existing standard matches the primary home. Uh, but under the new proposed standard, uh, this new angled roof setback plane would allow for different roof types and heights instead of having to match the 
pitch of the, of the uh, main home. And then um, that also sets, that angled setback plane sets the high wall further back from the neighboring property. It doesn't specify roof form. So moving down the list, uh, items five and six, owner occupancy. Um, this is that requirement that an owner live on the site with the accessory, uh, on a site that has an accessory dwelling unit. There has to be an owner uh, in residence currently. Um, and so as proposed, uh, only on a lot with an accessory dwelling unit and a short-term rental, the owner occupancy would be required. And in that case, there would be a, an associated uh, covenant deed restriction just like as exists currently, but only for uh, a short-term rental. And that would be uh, up to 30 days. And then uh, the next one is for item seven for the relaxed parking requirement. Currently, one additional off-street parking space is required for the accessory dwelling unit. As proposed, uh, for a studio or one bedroom, there would be no parking space required. Uh, no, uh, uh, and then one parking space for two bedrooms, and then more than two bedrooms, uh, one additional sp uh, space per bedroom. Um, and you may know that uh, this would extend the current rules for uh, under state law that are not changing, that exclude requiring parking for accessory dwelling units that are within one quarter mile of transit with service intervals of 15 minutes for at least five hours during peak operating hours. So that would, that would continue, to be, continue to apply for all of those accessory dwelling units in those areas. And then finally, uh, for accessory dwelling units, uh, for this topic, uh, is the additional change in some residential zones. Again, residential two-family, residential multifamily, residential high-density, zones that would be to allow a, an attached or detached accessory dwelling unit permitted with a principal structure that's permitted in those zones such as a duplex or a triplex um, if the, as the case may be. And then so rounding out the list, um, we know we've talked about all these highlighted changes relating to size and bulk, owner occupancy, uh, parking permitted uh, and, and then permitting with a duplex in some zones and this is just to help the public um, when they give their comments, this overall list. Commissioner Francis? Yeah, on the short-term rental requirement, um, what happens if someone builds an ADU and then they sell the home and that new owner says, okay, I'm gonna make one of them a short-term rental, are they gonna be required to be an occupant? Retroactive, you know, so, you know what I'm asking is that are future owners held to that same requirement? Yeah, the idea would be that if the, as part of the permitting of the short-term rental, that that owner occupancy requirement would kick in if there's an accessory dwelling unit. And then conversely, if they both, they decide to turn those both into long-term rentals, they could make both of them long-term rentals. Correct. Okay, thanks. Can I ask a follow-up? Sure, Baker. Um, sorry, I gotta speak really close to this. So, you know, the covenant thing, I don't recall seeing before in any of the workshops and perhaps that's on me for, for missing that. Can you talk a little bit more about the covenant idea there and why that's not being explored via other means, for example, by uh, being a condition of a short-term rental license or something along those lines? And the reason that I'm asking this is because covenants are famously difficult to deal with. And so if there is a change as described by Commissioner Francis, that covenant could effectively still be in place and be limiting potential future uses of the property and difficult to get rid of. Yeah, the, uh, the covenant is an existing, um, is an existing requirement for the owner occupancy. So uh, the, is the proposed under the, under the current code where okay. an, for an accessory dwelling unit, there's a, a required owner situation in either the ADU or the main residence. And so the, the proposed changes to the text would just change that when that covenant is required and it would be triggered by the short-term rental. And um, in our preliminary discussions with staff, that's just an understanding of uh, an easier way to enforce that requirement that the owner, owner live on the site. But I think as we go forward, you know, before we do final adoption with the city council, we'll, we'll explore further with staff about, uh, you know, similar to your suggestion about some 
um, possibly under the licensing yeah. um, requirements or if there, if there may be another means for enforcement. But um, as, it, as it stands, that was just looking at changing that covenant requirement to no longer apply to all cases, but gotcha. only if there's a short-term rental. So it's actually property. made it less restrictive then? Correct, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. So one follow-up to the short-term rental thing. So if, if they build the ADU, does it, does it limit either of them from being a short-term rental or could they turn in their primary, the primary uh, residence to a short-term rental and then do a long-term rental on the ADU? They yeah, the, the text is just, um, it just says if there's a lot with, uh, or, um, a, a lot that has an ADU and a short-term rental. So it doesn't matter if it's the main residence that's being converted to the short-term rental or if it's the accessory dwelling unit. Um, either one would trigger the requirement okay. that an owner live on the site. Just want to make sure there wasn't a loophole there. So to the commission, absolutely okay to ask questions during the presentation. Um, we also have the opportunity in, to ask questions to, to, um, to Mr. Gwynn and, and Ms. Beck uh, during the deliberation. So, but just, we're, we're, not, we're not in violation of anything, just make sure we're not getting into the deliberation during the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's um, the actual text is where a lot with an ADU also has a short-term rental under Chapter 17C316, Spokane Municipal Code. That, Thank you. That's on page A16 of the agenda packet if you want to find it. A 18? Uh, A16. Oh, A16, thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Winger. I guess the short-term rental would be uh, less than 30 nights? Correct, yeah. Okay. Mr. Gwynn, is that, is that a good point? Just, are you, are you, are you compl uh, finished? Um, so, yeah, we'd, we'd leave it up to the commission to, um, if we want to hit all the topics and then have public testimony, um, we have a final slide at the end that okay. has uh, kind of all the topics listed, but this would be, if you would like to pause and take testimony now. That's no, fine. no, thank you. I, I think it's our intent to go through all, all of the three of the presentations, take testimony on all three, and then we'll break it up during motions and deliberation. So the next section of code that is before you is for lot size transition. That's an existing standard that we have for lots that are two acres or larger in the residential agriculture or residential single family. So uh, there's an 80 foot buffer that goes along the parcel lines and within that buffer is when you are required to have a lot size that transitions. And the, the easiest way to explain it is that the lot size transition is based on averaging the existing lot sizes around you. So if they are large lot sizes, your minimum is gonna be 7,200 square feet for that transition lot size within the buffer. If you happen to be around lots that are smaller or a mix of larger and smaller, you can be the average or larger. So what we have found is that the intent, which is to try and ensure that new lots are sort of compatible and fit within an existing neighborhood, is that developers will add on additional length or do some other dimensional um, standards as long as it meets the underlying zoning district to meet that minimum square footage. So you could have multiple neighbors backing up against your yard, which is often what we hear um, people will be concerned with new housing developments on the edge of them, you know, new neighbors, new fences going up. And so what we had proposed after workshopping with Plan Commission is to remove that requirement. Initially, we had drafted multiple options, and at the February 23rd workshop, it seemed that the direction was, let's remove it, let's treat all lots to whatever their underlying zoning district is, um, staff believes that that streamlines the, the code and it also makes things much simpler when you are looking through the code to figure out a back of the envelope sort of analysis on a lot, how many can I get? And while it may not be a very large impact, 
by allowing lots to fit whatever their underlying zoning district is, we will get more housing units because there will be smaller lots. So we're not forcing developers to create larger lots. Then there's one last section. Yeah, so this is the last of the three sections for this hearing uh, containing, uh, or this would change procedures for review of short subdivision applications for subdivisions up to nine lots. And this is a type of a land use decision that the city makes uh, and the factors for this decision involve uh, or include the land, the survey, application, and a, and a public process and decision. Um, and then there may be improvements uh, that have been identified um, that are, would be uh, made appropriate for extending utilities or uh, streets to serve the new lots, um, followed by a final check and preparation of a final plat so that the, the new lots can be prepared, can be sold separately and developed. Um, so the streamlining that has been identified for this uh, process improvement is uh, looking uh, is looking at these uh, notification requirements as part of the application and decision um, so the notice of application does include a posting a, a posting a sign like this one shown um, and uh, that's posted on the site and then there's also a mailing to properties within 400 feet from the subdivision site with an associated 15-day comment period and this activity is in addition to a request for comments that occurs for all short plats over a two week period. That's sent to agencies and neighborhood councils within 600 feet of the subdivision site. So there's, uh, there's actually two comment periods um, involved, one for agencies and then this separate one that, that involves um, posting the site and a notice of application. So this has been identified as a cost saving opportunity um, that can be passed down to the end user, renter or homeowner uh, at who is the end user of the lots that are created from the subdivision. Um, and then this may be where the additional public notice possibly does not relate as directly uh, as, as when there's a physical change to the right-of-way when those improvements are made for utilities and streets and so forth that uh, are impactful to the immediate neighborhood. Uh, so uh, the proposal is to continue to require that agency and neighborhood notification and have no change to that procedure for any short plot. Uh, but to reduce costs for short plat notification for mailed notice only, so no site posting uh, with a standard engineering review and no, uh, and um, that's a standard engineering review usually refers to um, that final check and, and those um, and uh, dedication of uh, easements and right of way and so forth and extension of utilities and streets. And then um, there would be a, a discontinuation of the mailed notice and reduce uh, reduction to the review time that's associated with that following that initial request for two-week period for agency comments with uh, additional criteria for review that uh, aligns better with the city's city staff's review process and that includes uh, that uh, minor engineering review and so those criteria are that uh, the application has no has existing frontage on on an existing right-of-way um, there's no extension for water, sewer, or utilities in that right of way. Um, and then there's no easements associated with it for infrastructure. Um, so this aligns not only better with the city's review process, but also with potential changes to the application fees that are being contemplated kind of separately from this um, change to notification. And this is just a final uh, kind of recap of the proposal again. Um, for short plot notification uh, and uh, just requiring a mailed notice for short plots with standard engineering review and agency comment request only uh, for short plots subject to minor engineering review. Ms. Winkes? Uh, yes. Um, I was, I understood that uh, neighborhood councils are part of the agency, a list of agencies and I was going along quite nicely with all of that until I realized at one of the last presentations that uh, the expectation was that the neighborhood council would uh, pull all those comments, if there are any, together and do one um, response. Um, and neighborhood councils meet monthly or quarterly or sometimes they don't meet, like in July and August or in July, uh, August and December, they all have different schedules. And a 15-day notice is 
virtually impossible. I, I, I think the no onus to have the neighborhood council chair send it out to the neighborhood for comment is fine as long as they can send it in individually to the city, but to have to pull that all together on times when the neighborhood council may not even meet is, I think, nearly impossible. So as long as there's an understanding or it's written that it can be um, individual comments coming from the neighborhoods, um, I, I'm certainly, as a neighborhood council chair, more than willing to send it out to the distribution list and say, if you've got concerns about this, please get them into the city. I don't think it's possible without meetings or anything else to pull that together. So I just want to find out if that can be clarified. Yeah, it's, it certainly is up to the individual neighborhood council as to how they do that. This was um, a change in 2015 to add neighborhood councils to the, um, the, the agency review process, so it does add an extra um, uh, notification. Yeah, I, I appreciate that the uh, neighborhood councils are recognized. I'm just, when I heard from, oh dear, I'm gonna forget her name again, that it was expected that the, um, the comments would come in as collated and a set of comments that I, I, I work on this with my neighborhood constantly. I'm doing something and I don't think I could add another thing to it and try and pull it together in 15 days, whether or not there's a meeting. Mary, um, I'm trying to think what the best way to make sure this gets heard in this hearing and that the voice of the neighborhoods, and I'm wondering if, if you're, you're gonna be here for the, um, you, for the deliberation, right? Um, and for everyone, what I'm asking here is, yeah. the commissioners all have a vote. M Mary is, is our community assembly liaison, and so um, it's absolutely okay to participate, to my understanding, and right. then not vote. So I wonder, should we bring this into the deliberation, maybe? And then we can still have access to, um, to Mr. Gwynn and, and Ms. Beck and then really dive deep on that? Yeah, whatever, whatever works. Okay, I, let's, I'm, I'm if you're okay with that, let's, let's yeah. do that and, let's, okay. and, then, and then limit right now. I think, I think you're complete right on the presentation. Um, are there any clarifying questions uh, that are appropriate now okay. before we get into public testimony? Appropriate, yeah. Commissioner Francis. Um, so with regards to uh, um, site notification and then the mailed notification, is there any form of electronic notification where the resident, a resident of the neighborhood that was maybe outside of the noti mailed notification area would be able to see this information if they wanted to? Yes, there, there is a permit alert system that is available through the city's open data platform uh, they, so they can see any permit in the city uh, and, and can track it that way. They can set up, um, you know, like a geofence area um, if they're concerned about a, a particular neighborhood, for example, or a particular, you know, uh, area in the city, um, several blocks. Um, they can sign up for notification that way, uh, and then they can see all permits going back three years. Uh, so they could, they could find out that way. Um, and I, I understand that that's um, where we've heard, I guess anecdotally, that that isn't uh, necessarily always reliable, but um, I, think, I think that's the idea, is that um, you, you can go in and set up those alerts to kind of, you have to stay up on it and check your email periodically, but you would be notified if there was a new permit that came in uh, right. of the class you want to track. Thanks. Any other commissioner questions? Commissioner Neely, I'm just monitoring online. Just, okay. Okay. Thank you. Please stick around. <laughs> I know you will. Uh, okay. So what we've just done is we've taken the staff presentation on the three different items in this in this in this uh, hearing. First of all, I want to thank the whole department and especially Ms. Beck and Mr. Gwynn. Um, this has been a very thorough, transparent process. We've, we're, we're well prepared. We've had multiple workshops, and I, and I want to commend and compliment on the staff report. I thought that was, I personally thought that was very well written and, and, um, and set us up well for today. 
uh, which is part of the, the, the packet and the agenda. Uh, okay, so with that, we are going to open the oral testimony. Um, again, we have four names, I think, that would like to speak to this, and if anyone else after those four names would like to uh, get our attention either online or in person, please please do so. But let's, um, I believe in person, do we have Ms. Dirks, is that correct? Welcome, and uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll set a timer for, for three minutes, but please uh, state your name and... Welcome to Plan Commission. Thank you. First time here. Great. Um, my name is Laura Dirks, and my plans are to build a detached ADU unit with a garage. Um, my mom's at the stage where she can no longer live by herself, so um, I'm planning to move her in. I do live in the main home right now with my daughter and granddaughter, um, and if we get bigger square footage, I get a bedroom, <laughs> otherwise she's the only one that gets one. And I'm proud to say that I'm a block and a half from the bus line. So, um, and I'm in a growing area. I'm right off from, didn't know a lot of the green stuff, Green Street, uh, Carlisle going on. I'm just half a block from Carlisle, so yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for your time and I appreciate it. Let's get this going. <laughs> My builder's waiting. <laughs> Thank, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Is, uh, any questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I think we're now online. So is there a Mr. Mr. Brake? Okay. Greetings. Please uh, go ahead and state your name, please, and we'll start three minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Gene. Oh, sorry. I'm hearing echo. So uh, my name is uh, Gene Brake. I'm in the Emerson Garfield neighborhood, and I serve on the Emerson Garfield Neighborhood Council. Um, I have previously served on the Land Use Committee of Community Assembly. Um, I am also, was also involved in the North Monroe Business District, so I've worked with Mr. Gwynn many times, and sorry to see him go. He's been a great advocate for our communities, usually. Um, additionally, I serve on the Housing Action Subcommittee looking and exploring ways that we can expand housing. Um, lastly, I'm a realtor for the last 13 years. So I don't want anyone, so I understand the problems and I understand the situations as they affect our neighborhoods and the need for housing. But I have um, great concerns about some of the way this is being approached. Um, and as you know, we certainly have an ever increasing and rapidly increasing cost for housing in our city, in many cities, but in our city in particular. And my concern is how the planned um, ADU um, expansion may impact that um, and may exacerbate our concerns with ever increasing prices as well as the availability. Um, uh, there were three concerns that I had. One specifically was the um, removing the requirement for an owner occupancy. I think it raves a red flag to developers that those homes would be better served as investment vehicles, which we see an ever growing number of investors in our market that are driving up the cost of housing for our first time buyers. And I have a concern about the size not the 864 square feet. I think that's a very logical and viable size. But when you say 75% or 75%, uh, that becomes concerning, especially on some of our homes in my neighborhood in Emerson Garfield. If a home is 4,000 square feet, as some of these older homes are, um, it could absolutely um, allow a 3,000 square foot home uh, be built in the backyard, assuming the coverage, of course. So I'm concerned about those two parts of it, um, um, how it would impact our neighborhoods, and I would urge caution on those, especially as it pertains to two other things that appear have been removed out of this hearing, and that would be the expansion of duplexes and short-term rental expansions. So um, just on the topics, for the three topics today, my only concern is the owner occupancy um, removal for an ADU and the overall size of 75%. That would be it. Okay, thank you for that. 
Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Watkins. Welcome. By the way, was that echo better after? Was that corrected? Okay, thank you. Mr. Watkins, did. Uh, we're, yeah, we're ready. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, sorry about that. Well, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity for me able to talk with you. Um, I, without no disrespect to Mr. Brake, I would like to say that um, at this point in the marketplace, there's no evidence that we are seeing any corporate buyers coming in in large numbers. Um, at, the numbers just aren't there. Part of that is, in, is because of the fact that our prices are going up so fast that corporate buyers tend to shy away when they don't see a deal. They don't have an opportunity to step into the marketplace. In fact, what we're seeing is still a very high number of family buyers and buyers from out of the market. Um, often, we're still seeing a lot of cash buyers, and most of those um, that we have been monitoring appear to all be people moving from out of the area in here. So while that may change, uh, at this point, I can tell you that the data supports that we are not seeing those changes yet in driving up the house prices. Instead, there's some different numbers I'd like to talk about. Uh, first off, I just want to say that I think that staff has done a very measured and intelligent approach to all of these issues here. We believe they're well thought out. They actually do adequate, adequately address what they propose. Um, we have introduced, as you know, the Counselors of Real Estate report. That was an extensive report done on what needed to be done. Um, and these are among those changes. So we're excited to see them coming to play. Well, there's a lot of conversations that you've had in this committee about the how to make this work. Testimony I'd like to give you tonight has to do more with the why. And the issue, something we can all agree on, is that we don't have enough density. The new census numbers are very disturbing. It shows that we are roughly 25% underbuilt in the city of Spokane, 25%. And that even equals out to about 25,000 families that do not have a place to live. What's the result? Well, we have seen continually rising house prices, Rental vacancies hovering around 1%, with rents continuing to see double-digit increases just to keep up with costs. Where everyone is living is something that's critical to this conversation tonight. Um, we are seeing the greatest increase in multi-generational living in history. It puts an entirely new viewpoint when we start talking about conversations about ADUs. For example, one in four families right now are living in multi-generational housing. We have seen an increase of 65% of young people under 25 living at home. If you have a kid under 25, you're probably one of those. But during COVID, we saw some other big changes. One in three elderly adults moved back in with parents. We have one in eight family members who have also moved in to help out with childcare. So what does this say? This puts a greater emphasis, we believe, on the way that we live. And hence, when we come to talk about ADUs, it becomes even more paramount, not just as a a numbers need, but as a social need. Transition zones are something we're talking about here. Unfortunately, it's unique to Spokane. It's an artificial construct that we see as getting in the way of building. It's something that can be easily changed and just allows for housing of one type to be next to the same zone that they're in. As far as the SEPA rules, state EPA, the state EPA, which is what SEPA is, long ago eliminated the need for SEPA review under 20 lots. But we think that for Spokane to adapt to what the rules are already under state law, under a state process, we think that it's, it's, it's a good thing to bring those in. So what should be clear through all of this is the point that we're trying to make now, is that while, while we have been talking about how to make density happen, there is a new why that we should all really watch for. Because if Spokane does not take these steps that are so desperately needed, to make these changes, what we know is that the state legislature is going to do it for us. We have already seen some rather draconian introductions that came very close to passing in just this last session. So, for example, up to a fourplex in any zone, taking away all local control. Those are some serious things that are about to happen. These proposals will be coming back, but how do we head those off? do that by making the changes we can when we can. And to this commission, I applaud you for these chances. They're small steps, but they're very critical, 
and the why becomes even more important. Thank you for your opportunity. All right. Thank, thank you for that, Mr. Watkins. Um, and just for, for everyone, we, we went a little long on that, but it's, it's okay, because thank you for speaking to multiple items there. I, I, didn't, I didn't anticipate or think about that. Um, okay, and then um, the last we have signed up is um, Ms. Pappas. Are you available? Welcome. Yeah. Hello, commissioners and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today, and apologies about apparently the show is not leaving us. Uh, my name is Michelle Pappas, the Spokane Program Director for FutureWise, a land use nonprofit here in Spokane. FutureWise strongly supports planning policies that encourage the development of equitable communities, and we see many good ideas included in these changes that could result in positive on the ground improvements in Spokane communities. We fully support the lot transition code changes. We look forward to this creating additional infill housing, particularly in locations with transit options and existing services. We additionally support the new proposed changes, especially as it pertains to removing the owner occupancy requirements for long term rentals in residential two family, residential multifamily, residential high density, and then the adjusting of the residential agriculture, residential single family, and residential single family craft. Additionally, the removal of the parking requirement. As the owner of a residential family lot, I can attest that this lot does not require on-site parking by must an ADU. Lastly, we are in support of the changes to the short plat application process. I would also like to take a moment and out my frustration about a lack of transparency and foresight regarding a timeline available to the public. I was told on March 21st that there was no timeline, but simply based on an earlier slide in this meeting, that that was not the case. Uh, that timeline began February 1st. Uh, this lack of timeline has been a barrier to us and the public to fully participate. I look forward to creating uh, missing middle housing while building full and cohesive neighborhoods that serve our entire community through these zoning changes. Thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Pappas. Um, can you clarify? I, it broke out a little bit, so I'm not sure I, I fully understood the February 1st component of that again. Could you repeat that, please? Your concern? Absolutely. I, I was trying to tell and get a clear understanding of what the timeline for reviewing and the public testimony on these. Um, and I, in an email on March 21st, was told that there was no timeline at that point. But I'm seeing based off of the slide that was at the beginning of this meeting that the timeline for the plan session began February 1st. So there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between the information that I was given and the information that was shared at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for your testimony. Any other questions? Uh, Michelle, could you repeat which organization you're with? I'm with FutureWise. All right, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, give an opportunity here. That's the end of our, our sign-in list, but is anyone else here in person or online that would like to uh, like to testify to this? Okay, thank you. So seeing none, uh, we will now close the public record on this hearing item, uh, which now allows us to move into uh, a motion. All right, so uh, with the motions, we're gonna actually look at ADUs, lot size transitions, and short plat notification process separately. So I'm gonna begin with ADUs. I move to recommend that City Council adopt the changes to the accessory dwelling unit code in SMC chapter 17C.110 and 17C.300 and the associated tables as written and presented. Second. Okay, so it's been moved by Commissioner Francis and seconded by Commissioner Winger. And just to clarify, so we, we intend to get through all these um, today, but by breaking them up if we have to, that we can continue to next to a, a, a hearing at a 
date certain in the future. Okay, um, so with this first, um, first motion related to the accessory dwelling unit components, and I specifically, let's clarify, um, by the way, this table is really helpful. <laughs> so, well done. And they're labeled <clears throat> ADU1 through ADU8, so that's what we're talking about now. Um, okay, let's, let's open deliberation. Go ahead, um, Commissioner Williams. I, I think they, clearly the staff's done a good job. We've been through this quite a few times. Um, I'm in support of all the changes. Um, the one thing that maybe uh, in a, maybe it will be a different year, but um, whether there might be a, a simpler way uh, with our code to allow ADUs by just using floor area ratio and just saying let the homeowner or the owner of the property build what they want with uh, and limit it through floor area ratio, which would be a lot simpler than all the, the different requirements. But for now, for where we are, I think these are really excellent recommendations. Thank you, and, and I wanna, we've strategized a little bit before this, this hearing. Um, so we have these eight different items here. If anyone, well, first of all, we're in open deliberation on the main motion, so we can talk about anything. So if you wanna just, talk it out first before you would propose a, a secondary amendment or motion, a motion for amendment, uh, we can do that. But if, if anyone also has, has any amendments, um, perhaps it would be ideal if we just took them one at a time and, and, uh, and then bring them back to the main motion. The main motion. Uh, Commissioner Francis. I don't have an amendment. I'm, I'm just going to say, you know, we've been working on this for months and, you know, I've followed the ADU process for years now. I, I remember working with Mr. Gardner prior to him being the planning director um, on ADU reform and we've been working on, you know, it, this has been a long road. And I think that what we've, the changes that are percent, per, ah, proposed here are good changes. They may not be perfect changes, but they move us so far beyond where we were or where we currently are. And so um, we may see at some point that, you know, we might have to make a tweak here and there to, to make it even better. But I think uh, uh, all these changes have really been beneficial and I'm really hoping that we can pass this and I'm gonna support it as, as it's written. I'll, I'll certainly entertain any sort of amendments that people have, but I think it's good the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll raise a couple of points. I, I agree, first of all, I, I intend to support this and, and I, I think it's a, a good package. Um, I've expressed in the workshops that it, it's also not the fault of this effort. Our development code is complicated with, in Spokane with lots of layers of restrictions. And I think some of them are very, very redundant. So maybe that's building a little off what Commissioner Williams said is, is I think there's ways to simplify this in the future. Now is probably not the time to, uh, or it wouldn't be appropriate at this point to make an amendment to, to try to um, eliminate any of these, or many of these items. Um, okay, that said, um, I'd be curious to, for the commission to talk a little bit about, well, let's just start with ADU1. There was, there was public testimony today on, on, on the discussion of 864 and 75. We definitely went over this in workshop. Um, does anyone have any, any additional um, comments or concerns over, over that? Commissioner Banks, sorry. Jump in, if I may. Um, you know, I, I have, and I've expressed in workshop as well, I have similar concerns to, to both you and Commissioner Williams about the uh, added complexity that we're choosing to add for ADU specifically. I, I think we have in our code, we've sort of gotten to a point where we have a really good way of adjusting the amount of size of building, quantity of building, if you will, on a site and this, it seems an extra and unnecessary complication to continue to throw in 
um, further restrictions on the ADUs. However, that being said, I think this is a great step forward. And, and so perhaps there is a way that this can be revisited sometime down the road if we continue to not see ADU uptake and permits being issued the way that we'd like them to be. Perhaps there could be uh, some sort of a amendment that allows more flexibility there. Um, but I really do feel strongly that the 75% issue there, I know there were some concerns raised um, by members of the community about that. I, I think that is a really big thing, primarily because so much of the focus has been on developing relatively small units, which serves a certain portion of the market, but it, it eliminates a larger portion of the market, families, larger you know, multi-generational homes, as, um, as Mr. Watkins was referring to that you know could use a larger ADU and could need have to have multiple bedrooms etc and so that 75% really preserves that and so i think that's a really important element in there on the lots for which that's appropriate um, so i i too I, I support this wholeheartedly i support all of these items wholeheartedly but also would support an amendment uh, that eliminates that and allows FAR and lot coverage to govern Commissioner Francis, <laughs> you want to go first? Oh, I was just going to say that I, I similarly agree that the 75% is a good addition to allowing for larger uh, sizes that may on a lot that it would apply to and that the concern of overly large structures is very likely a minimum possibility given, you know, that there are very few lots and houses in which that could happen. And if we govern our decisions by the remote possibility that a few might be larger than is wished, then we're, we're limiting the majority of the city to even stricter standards. Mr. Francis? So, you know, I, I get yeah, you know, we do have multiple constraining factors on the size of an ADU. Um, and we added the 75% house size because we saw the other one is too constraining, uh, the 864, which was, I think, 800 at the time. Um, the reason why I support those, and, and I do think our development code is overly complex and, and could really use some simplification. Um, to me, the benefit of those hard numbers is it, it is very clear to a potential homeowner what they can do. Yeah. You know, they can look at 864 and say, okay, I can build up to 864. Now, they still have the FAR restriction. I guess they could go in for um, and do a calculation and say, oh, you're too high. But to me, I think one of the things about that is it increases clarity to those people that are looking at options on, in their building where they don't have to really understand what FAR is or, or do any sort of calculations there. So that's why I like those. Um, I'd certainly entertain options to do otherwise, but I think this is a good compromise and that we could revisit in the future if we needed to. Okay, I, I'll add a, some in here. Um, yeah, I've expressed in workshop my challenge with this isn't so much specifically about within the rules of calling this accessory, what do we do? Again, we're not gonna address this today, but we'll, it goes back to the definition of accessory, meaning, you know, not primary. <laughs> it's a second, secondary building. Um, and what concerns me when we say that is, is if, if, we, if we all approach this accessory, accessory as, therefore it has to be smaller, Okay, that's, those are the rules we're playing here, and in the future, if, if, if more density is allowed or more units per, per parcel is allowed, that'll just be called something else. It'll be called a dwelling unit, which is a home, means kitchen, bathroom, so forth, right? That's our definitions in, in, in um, Chapter 4, or Title 4, I think, that's right. Um, so my point here is, is, I guess we're playing by the rules that it, it, this has to be a smaller building than the primary resident, is what we're saying. Okay. If so, I think others then, I'm trying to flesh out here, 
does the commission think that that means it has to look like an accessory building, a different building type? Is, is, is this a, if a dwelling unit is a home, that's what we're trying to achieve here, does it have to look like a garage? Does it have to look like a shed? Does it have to have those proportions that somehow we're, we're, that's what we're trying to achieve or are we just trying to create a home, a smaller compact home? Go ahead, Commissioner Patterson. I, the, and until you brought this up, I think it was initially brought up during a workshop and then this time, it had never even occurred to me that there was some sort of look that an accessory building has to have. Um, and I, one of the things I'm excited about with what we're doing now is that we're removing some of the things that made it have to match the existing structure because those are limiting architecturally and size wise. Um, however, I guess we don't say it. And so it, I don't see how there would be, there is no definition of like what garages even look like. So, <laughs> Um, I mean, I've seen some really ugly garages, um, but I've also seen some really awesome ones. So um, my support for accessory dwelling unit, as far as the name, for simplicity's sake, because nationally, and if you're looking for, you know, you're looking for plans or you're looking for, you know, a, a prefab unit, it helps people understand that, like, that is the thing that um, we're helping, you know, we're permitting here. Um, but I guess I would never be concerned about like what it looks like. And we don't define that in here with any restrictions. So what well, does a shed look like? Well, <laughs> no, I think it's a good point. I, I would maybe ask the question, what we do in terms of the dimensional standards, right? And um, so let's, let's get back to that. But I guess my question is then if, are we trying to make a home look like something else? That's what we're trying to do? Or are we trying to say it's a, it's a small home? Therefore, could it be just very similar to our, our, our cottage housing requirements? And so then I would ask, 864 seemed to come about as a dimension 24 by 36. Can we just align with what we've already defined? There's precedent in our, in our development code for, com, for a, um, for a cottage house, which is 1,200 square feet. That's also the size we, um, I believe, on a duplex that we're saying that, that means small. So is, is it better just to find that, that alignment with that? 1,200 and then I, I think it's debatable, or 75%. That would be my proposal. I'm not making the motion yet, but I want to throw it out there, yeah. I, I think, I can't remember now who, who it was that said that, um, who talked about 864 being like something that's accessible for people to look at a number and understand like that's maybe something I could do. If we start throwing around numbers like 1200, that's, that wouldn't fulfill a lot of these other numbers for the home. You know, like as far as 1200 would be too big for uh, like the, the floor area ratio, I believe on a lot of the smaller lots. And so it could make it more difficult for people when they're looking at thinking initially, oh, I could do something 1,200 square feet, and then they have to get into the more complicated um, lot restrictions to, you know, and then they're disappointed. So. Commissioner Francis. Well, 1,200 is very possible if you have a larger primary residence and you have a large enough lot. That's key. We already allow 75% or whichever is greater, you know. So it, yeah. you could get a 1,200 square foot. I think that I do consider these accessory. I think they're accessory to the main dwelling unit, and so I do think that the scale should be slightly smaller than the primary residence. Um, I know that there are some residences that are extremely small, and that creates a challenge. Um, but I don't even think of 1,200 square feet as small. That's the size of my home, and I think of my home as good sized. So um, I think it's a very reasonable size. And I, so I do think the 864 is a good compromise over the 600 that we started with in the current code. So I don't see a need for a change because that's why we added the 75%, so we could go higher on larger lots and larger residences. Commissioner Bank? Yeah, you know, I, I 
to struggle with the idea of accessory. I, it's, you know, I have a little bit of a different take than you, Commissioner Francis. I, I think we've sort of, as a city, have come, we've made the philosophical leap that two dwelling units on a piece of property is an okay condition. But then we're having to put in this other level in that says, well, but one of them has to be subordinate. You know, they, they can't both be equal. And there's all sorts of questions about socioeconomic status there. And there's a lot of things that cause me a lot of indigestion. But to your point at the beginning, President Byruther, we're playing in a framework here and we're, we're sort of having to play the game. And so I think it's important in this setting to ask these questions and raise some of these issues. Are we gonna be able to do something fundamentally about this sort of imbalance in this hearing? I, I don't think so. And to that end, I think these changes are moving the ball forward and therefore are good and they're, they're playing within the rules of the game that we have today. But I, I agree, I think there is a larger question there about equal treatment of dwelling units and are we intentionally unequally treating different dwelling units and if so, for what reason, et cetera. It's more of a musing than a point, but. <laughs> That's okay, the right forum to do it. Uh, Commissioner Francis. Wow, we're gonna have fun with this. So, <laughs> I'm, I agree. See, I can agree. I am, this is one of the long range issues that I think we need to look at is whether or not I'm, you know, a, a, at some point, can ADU be sold? Can it be owner occupied, can both be owner occupied by different owners? Um, and there's, I think, the opportunity for ownership is a great opportunity that we're not doing here. Not ready for it. Um, but I think there's more to that than we can bite off here and, and handle because we have to look at, well, is an ADU that's fronting on an alley does that meet the requirements for a residence? Um, you know, we're not, we have a requirement for utilities to be shared between the two. Um, and there's some of those things that are not handled here that I think in the future we'll want to look at. I mean, there's mechanisms for, for ownership of a, an ADU right now. It's just not very easy because it requires, I think, like a condo type agreement. Um, but I think that's, that's something we can't take on right now, but I think it is something that is worth considering in the future because I'd love to see the opportunity to split off a portion of my back lot if it had an alley behind it, which it doesn't, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, develop an ADU there and have it sold to someone else. But there's, that creates a whole lot of complexity and lot size and, and that sort of thing, so. Commissioner Neely. Um, for once, I'm gonna stay fairly concise, I hope. Um, these ADUs are important, they're necessary. Um, if we get it wrong, we'll fix it. But in the meantime, the city needs housing. This has got to move forward. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna make one more point. Um, we are looking at the technical side, let's call it, of development code here. So all of these are, are, are very wonky, you know, calculated um, um, ad amendments that have gone through a, a pretty robust, or let's say pretty, a robust public process. What we haven't considered is development feasibility. Now, I'm not, it, it, it's been part of the discussion and so forth, but we don't have any, any analysis that points to what impact will this have if we do it? And will 864 have more or less impact than 1200? And so, again, we don't have the information, but I wanna now propose that 1200 also makes this more feasible from a development side. So is it technically viable first? Yes. And then is it, is it feasible in terms of development? Um, will, will, will people actually do it? Because I think we have to, we're talking a lot about restrictions here 
And uh, but the reason we're doing this is how do we incentivize this to move forward and, and actually get these things built? And are we really that nervous that if we opened this up, that we would that we would uh, set a bad set bad precedents across the city? So, and I, I don't feel that way. So, I, I um, again, I would, I'd like to propose 1,200. I'm not going to make the motion unless there's some sort of of preliminary consensus that we could maybe, or we just do it and, and vote it down, and that's fine too, and just move on. So. Um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, one, uh, one last point. I, I do think Mr. Brake had a you know, valid, valid point. I think it's good to raise that question of 75% of a very large house. But again, backing down the math and looking at um, the requirements or the proposal in ADU 3 is that if you had a 4,000 square foot house and you, were to, and you wanted to add a 3,000 square foot ADU, Okay, that implies that you have 7,000 square feet and at your current FAR of 0.5, that means you have a 14,000 square foot lot and you're, not, you're already out of the lots less than 7,200. So you've got an enormous lot. Now those lots exist in the, in the city, but there are other discussions there about you use of that. You divide your lot. Of that <laughs> land, so right, exactly. So I, I, think, I think more importantly is, you know, if we, if we go with like an 80% rule, 80% of where this might be applied, I think, you know, I think um, Commissioner Patterson, you, you mentioned you're going to bump into FAR most likely before you, you have that kind of out of control concern. But, and I know that's been analyzed by the consultants and the, and the staff. So, okay. Um, is there any, any appetite for 1200 or should I just let it go? I have a question. Yes, please. Um, the, re I'm, the reasoning behind the 1200 is that that you think that seeing that number, seeing that 1,200 is going to entice people toward building ADUs more? Yeah, maybe I'll put it threefold. I, yes, I do believe that. I believe it will, it will be more feasible and, and, and we will develop it. I don't think 1,200 is too large. Um, I, I, I do design you know, these ADUs and, and townhomes and so forth, so I don't, I don't think 1,200 is un, unreasonable for, for a size of a, a home. And then, and then second, and the third is that I do believe there's precedent we have, it would be more consistent with our cottage home and our size of our proposed duplexes so forth. And so in doing so, by using the 1200, it may be more than 75%. Is that the idea that- If you, if you uh, have a- that, it could, that you could have something, you could, that would, the, it would set that minimum lower so that it might end up being equal to or larger than the existing. I think that you're absolutely right. That's possible if you have a small, a very small bungalow or small, you know, that, yeah, it could be equal size, perhaps. I'm sorry. Yes, it could be if, if, the, if the 1,200 is, is what you're saying, right? If the house, the primary house is 1,200. But again, now we just have two small cottage houses, and that's what we're trying to promote in the cottage house provision, so. No, it, but if, before I realized that that was how that would work, I was... I was like, well, why would, like, I think, you know, it's like, we already have 75%. What's this really going to give us? Um, I still think that it will probably cause some frustration for people who have smaller lots just because they're never going to, you know, their maximum is still going to be closer to this 864. Or FAR controlled. Um, right, because of, because of FAR. Um, and if it could be made easy for people to like, I don't know, like a little calculator or something for them to more easily figure out those, um, what their maximum for their lot is, I think that that would get us moves forward. But I, I do support the idea of, you know, not necessarily restricting to smaller than existing structure. Okay, Commissioner Bank. Uh, you know, I, hearing this conversation, which I agree with, I keep going back to then why are we not letting FAR, if we're going to bump into FAR anyway with some of these 1200s, why are we not just letting FAR govern? <laughs> quite, quite simple. You know, every, anyone can look up on the City of Spokane website, determine the size of their property, and divide that by two. Yep. You know, that, that's a very straightforward calculation. Um, and and then, then you're done. And it allows the full range of choices and, and et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Commissioner Wager, hold on, um, please. Um, uh, Commissioner Neely. Uh, Mr. President, I would support the, the 1200. I think I agree with you in terms of uh, its ability to, to attract more interest in the ADUs. Thank you. Commissioner Winger. 
Uh, 75% of 1,600 square feet is 1,200. So it's already included in, in uh, ADU 1 because a lot of homes in the city are bigger than 1,600 square feet. And you could go above that if you had a 2,000 square foot house. So it only be if, to me, Commissioner Patterson's comment, if it's a small, very small right. primary if home. If there's only, a, I mean, there are some 500 square foot homes mm -hmm. and on relatively weirdly large lots. Yeah. Um, and this could allow someone to build a 900 square foot ADU if we made this amendment. So in case. Um, I'm, I'm just bothered by, that's just, just me, by the definition of ADU and I looked it up and there is a legal definition and by legally it needs to be smaller. So it's not the same as two cottage homes. That's a different issue to me. It said it's got to be smaller than the primary residence. So I don't know how, I mean, I get, I get what, what people are trying to look at, and, but I don't know how it fits into the legal definition of an ADU, That's which good. I think we kind of have to be careful of, don't we? I mean, legal by whom, though? It's a, it, things like Black's Law Dictionary and legal Well, definitions. I know, but that's, I mean. We can't change legal definitions. Well, it's an, it's an important point. Um, um, could you protect, perhaps, or, or perhaps Director Gardner could Can read? Can I ask for a clarification? Are you looking in the city's code for the definition of accessory? No, I'm looking, I'm looking nationally. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll read the city's code Okay, that has maybe, a that, maybe that helps. So in the, this is in uh, section, se or Title 17A, 020010, and this is in the A definition, so you can okay. find it there if you want to see it. Accessory dwelling unit. An accessory dwelling unit is a separate additional living unit, including separate kitchen, sleeping, and bathroom facilities attached or detached from the primary residential unit on a single family lot. ADUs are known variously as mother in law apartments, accessory apartments, or second units. And that's it. So it doesn't doesn't need to so, be smaller so in by the city's code definition. there is no sp specification that it okay. has to be smaller. well that that helps me and maybe i'll make one la last point i said that already once <laughs> <laughs> um, as a designer and a manufacturer of of prefabricated homes if we have a difference between an adu if we want if, if we want to encourage in the city pre-qualified Pre, we, don't, we don't do that, other cities do, Seattle does, and, and it's not part of this package, but uh, we are proposing that those are two different typologies between, say, a cottage home and an ADU, and, and, and if, we, if that's what we mean, that's what, that's what we mean, that's okay. But I would propose that from a kind of structural design standpoint, it would sure be great if those start to come together a little more. Okay, um, I'll stop. Would, would anyone entertain a motion? Maybe I'll put it that way, uh, to propose I would. 864. Okay, so is, is, that, is that a motion then? That's okay. my motion. Thank you, and, and, and again, the, the chair does have the ability to make a motion here. I'll just I'll open it up though, if anyone else wants to, because if not, then that means there's no, <laughs> there's no support to get a majority vote. Can I ask for a point of clarification yes. of what's happening here? Because I heard a motion. Okay, so what, what I'm doing is I could make the motion as chair. We, those are within our rules, right? If you want to. But I'm, I'm trying not to use this position to, to push this agenda. So therefore, I asked if there was a motion, if there was support that someone would make a motion in a second. So Commissioner Neely said, made a motion. But if there's not support, then just say nothing and, and it dies. So, so there is the motion on the table. The motion's on the so, table. There's not a second if no one that, seconds. Is that the 1,200, 1200. motion? Okay, second. Okay, thank you. So now <laughs> we can deliberate on it if we want to, but that's the, that's the, the amendment on the, on, uh, under consideration right now. I heard Commissioner Neely say 864, so that's why yeah, I'm that's, confused. Yeah. Did I misunderstand what you were? Chris? No, I think we, the, the, the text got covered up by the delay. Hmm? Can you make the motion again? Can you clarify the motion? Commissioner Neal, yeah, be, go ahead. Um, and Mr. President, please correct me if I've gone off the rails here. The, the, the motion would be to correct, uh, amend this uh, text 
to remove eight, the 854 square feet and replace it with 1,200 square feet. That was that was my in, that yeah, correct? intent. Yes, correct. And is that what okay. Commissioner Banks you seconded? Okay. So now that's the that's the motion on the table, the the secondary motion on the table. So is there any any more discussion on that, or are we willing to vote? I have a, a question for s staff. Um, I'm supportive of that, but I'm wondering is there something we haven't thought through that people that spend a lot more time thinking about this have thought through? Um, so from Amanda or Nathan, is there, are we, um, could we run into any problems by switching to 1200 from 864? Because I would s support that in, from the perspective of more economical building, uh, it can attract a little more from the investment. It can be expensive to build a small ADU with running sewer and water. So there's a, there's a number of reasons to support the larger number, but we haven't had much discussion on it. So I just wondered if staff had any uh, concerns about the 1200 number. Please please uh, feel free to come up and. And I have a just a, at went after she um, a procedural of what happens if the recommendation is, um, what happens if this not amended is not adopted, is there a backup proposal that would be in front of city council to allow like our second best option? I, I think that's what I was referring to later, earlier, maybe not so. Okay, right, so, yeah, in, that, in the getting of that in the record. Yeah, we, we, could, we could propose that that's, that gets documented in the findings of fact, but, or, or if it just gets voted down, we just, it just goes back to the main motion. Commissioner Williams, to your question, um, I think so the way that we have drafted the code and the memo that was attached that noted the addition to um, 17C 300-110A2 that notes that the building, um, the, the building size would be limited by the FAR depending on whatever your lot size is and then also the building coverage. So. There, there might be concerns from current planning as far as increasing the size to 1,200 square feet, but that would be the ultimate size that you could get, right? There are still those two controlling factors of FAR and building coverage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is it okay if yeah, I feel free. Any, any supplement from, that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, please. Um, that's exactly right. Um, I think from the staff perspective, um, there are opportunities for us to communicate better with the public about what is possible. So the size itself is not, does not ultimately concern me. Um, that's just on us to make sure we're communicating it. If that's how the plan commission feels, we need to proceed. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Francis. <sighs> So we've negotiated back and forth about 864 feet. We added the 75% to compensate for large lots and larger homes. This has come up during workshops, increasing the size or dropping the size requirement altogether. And, and we came to, I thought, a consensus that 864 with the 75% requirement or option worked. I have, that's the way it's been presented to the public. It's, you know, when you look at this change, I think it's a substantial change. I'm not saying it's a substantial change that has to go out and go through public process again. But I'm also thinking about um, what city council is gonna face if we pass this and say, all right, ADUs are now 1,200 square feet or 75% of house size, I'm, there's gonna be substantial pushback and I know my neighbors are gonna push back on that. I'm, I'm supportive of ADUs, I'm supportive of improving this. I think 1,200 square foot on, on my lot is way too much and I might be able to do it with the bonus um, FAR. I don't know, because I have a relatively small home, by your definition. I think my home's fine. 
<laughs> I'm, anyway, so I'm not going to support this amendment because I, I think it's, I think we've created a nice balance that we can work with and most of the larger lots are going to be able to go to 1,200 square foot anyway because they're going to have the 1,600 square foot home size. And so I don't see a need for this amendment. Thanks. Go ahead. Commissioner Winger. Uh, yeah, being a neighborhood council uh, chair, uh, it's not a problem in my neighborhood, but through the CA I know other neighborhoods do have a problem if this becomes too large of a, an addition on a lot. And so uh, I would say a significant amount of the city might uh, have objections to if it was just 1,200. That's just my impression. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Patterson, thank you. And I think it mostly would be because the number seems big and misunderstanding. And I don't think, I don't think that if people fully understood how these rules work, they would have as much of a problem, but it could just be that we're going to run into like just a PR messaging issue because it sounds big at initial like first look. Um, and I do support the idea, like there are those weird small houses, I totally get it. And saying that this structure has to be smaller than that other strangely small house is ridiculous for those, but it might be we're not ready for it yet. And I think, I, I wanna get this passed, like, and I, I, do, I do have some concerns about um, it not happening. So Ms. Winkins and I, I, I'm just going to echo what Cliff said uh, so I think that uh, there will be pushback at, at CA and and there's already a number of neighborhood responses in the 85 pages that we received so I think doing this at the last minute and uh, it, it it will be noticed and I think it would cause issues that don't need to take place I guess thank you Commissioner Francis and I think uh, one other thing we have to consider is one of the things that has received some of the biggest comments is parking. And while we've, and I think it's a very good thing to drop the parking requirement for studios in one bedroom. When you go to a 1200 square foot ADU, you're gonna get the ability to get maybe three bedrooms. So you're gonna have two off street parking lot parking spots, plus assuming that you're gonna have two on street parking that's going to create a challenge in some of these denser areas already. Okay. Um, so that's another reason for me to not support this. It's back to you. Have yes, time. I'd like to make one point of clarification. So currently, if you were to have a smaller house on a lot uh, and you want to build an ADU, the way that our current planners look at that is your existing small house would become the ADU and the new house would be considered the primary. I was wondering about that. So it, that seems like that is a thing that keeps coming up. So I just wanted to make sure that people wouldn't be limited to whatever their existing house size is as far as looking at the size of the ADU. We would just switch what would be considered ADU versus primary. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Beck, can I ask you a math, math problem? <laughs> uh, sure. Okay. Just for the, for in, in the, you just make sure we're, we're going through this. So, if, if I'm gonna build um, an ADU uh, on top of a, you know, a garage, right? That was one of the options in the diagram. Um, and we're saying 864, does my garage where the car is parked, does that in, is that included in that square footage? So we would look at that 864 as the footprint, depending on what the lot size is with that FAR bonus, you could, well, you're limited by the ultimate height, mm -hmm. so depending on the size that your garage is actually occupying, taking out things for stairwells, it, it might be, depending on what the existing footprint is. That's the, this is the tricky part of talking about the numbers is we would need to know what the existing footprint size for the house is to calculate what the FAR is, look mm -hmm. at the lot size, but potentially. So let you know, go Can ahead. I ask, is your question whether the garage counts towards your FAR? Right. Uh, garage space does not count towards okay. FAR. And then my second question was stairs, and you already answered that. Those stairs do not include yeah. vertical circulation. So if I wanted to build a 20 by 30 
accessory dwelling unit with a garage down below, so that's 600 square feet on the floor footprint. And then let's say I could squeeze in a full size second floor, that's 1,200 square feet. So we, we're saying that my house looks like a garage and I can build a two story, 1,200 square foot building. And then, Mary, to your point, I'm never going to park a car in there. I'm going to I'm going to occupy it and put all my kids' bikes, and it's going to be occupiable space, but it's going to be permitted as a garage with a. Yeah, so I got a 1,200 square foot garage blob in my on my on my lot, right? So I just I think we're already allowing the the loophole, quite frankly. So uh, is what I'm saying. Um, but I don't know how you address that. I don't know if you say you only get this if there's no garage. I don't know. I mean, it's like we're we're just adding layer upon layer again, right? Yeah. Right. So I, I'm sorry. I did the math problem. It wasn't really. <laughs> I appreciate you doing your own math problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. She came unequipped with a calculator. Okay. Any other comments, or let's just um, do. You just want to do a voice vote on this, or do you just want to maybe do roll call for a split? Oh, Miss oh, Commissioner Neely. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the the thoughts of the members who are saying we're. We've been through a lot of conversation about getting to this size, and we have, um, and that there might be uh, some messaging pushback. There always is. But if we were going the other direction, if we were going from 1,200 down to some you know, lower number or something like that, I honestly believe we'd get more pushback than increasing the size, especially given the clarification by staff that you could build yourself a new uh, facility and the original house would become the ADU. Thank you. Okay. Well, if we've exhausted one of 12, <laughs> let's, uh, let's just take a quick roll call on that, please. On, so again, this is just on the amendment to 1,200 square feet. If this fails, we move back to the, regardless of whether it passes or fails, we move back to the main motion then. Thank you. All right, Jesse Bank. Aye. Todd Byrother. Aye. Greg Francis. Nay. Chris Neely. Aye. Ryan Patterson. <laughs> I'm so torn. Can I abstain? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Abstain. Okay. Tim Williams? Nay. Clifford Winger? Nay. Okay, so I believe that it's a tied vote. Motion fails then. Yep. Motion, Motion fails. fails. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you for going on that journey. <laughs> Welcome to Plan Commission, Commissioner Fran <laughs> <or> <laughs> Patterson. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone. In all seriousness, thank you for just if exploring that. I could just that. add a comment. I Please. think when we come back and look at simplifying things and looking at floor area ratio only as, yep. as a driver, then we can work more with the public and the neighborhoods to talk about property rights and you, you, you can build this much and yep. you can divide it up how you want and get to some of the questions Jesse raised about big building, little building and yeah. all that. So yep. I, I think we just need to move in steps and so yep. that's why I ended up after the discussion, voting against it. Nope, thank you, and and exactly. This is not the end of the road by any means. It's not even the end of the road of this. We're <laughs> recommending to the council, and there's plenty of time to spark the discussion and with uh, for the whole community with council, so. Okay. Um, One better chance of getting it through. Well, let's keep going. Um, ADU two, remove minimum lot size for <laughs> ADUs. <laughs> Are we gonna go through all these? I'd, well, I'd just I like to go, quick. go through these quick. Yeah, quick. Yeah. To, any discussion on that? No. No. Okay. Okay. ADU three FAR bonus. Um, I. So um, this this is logical. It makes sense. Okay. I I think we need to start thinking ahead of 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 how we do bonus structures. That's part of of the Growth Management Act. This is to incentivize. Is is and, and so I think we've talked about in workshop. Where should we have bonuses? Should we have them in density bonuses like Ellensburg does? Should we have FAR bonuses? Is, I think this is a good start. We already have 0.1 bonus for ADUs, I believe, in, our, in the current provisions, current code. So this, this steps up on a small lot. Um, 
I agree with the lots greater than 7,200 that there should be some threshold. So like the problem we talked about before, if you have a 14,000 square foot lot, it shouldn't get a 20% bonus, right? Well, I don't know that you shouldn't. I just, there's logic to that, right? Um, my proposal would be um, to align with what Seattle is currently thinking, and, and, and they've done quite a bit of analysis on this uh, through neighborhoods, uh, that 0.7 is appropriate for any ADU. Um, and if, if we need to keep it at 7,200, that's, that's okay. I think that makes sense. But it would just make it simple and say, ADUs are a 0.2 bump. And then in the future, I think there'll be other considerations of corner lots, alleys, and so forth. But let's just keep this simple and start here. Does anyone? Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead Commissioner <laughs> Francis. We're not Seattle. Um, <laughs> I, I, and, and I know that's a common argument by a lot of people. But we're not Seattle. Um, we're not Seattle. We're not Portland. We need density. Absolutely, we need density. But we are not in the situation that Seattle's in. We are not completely enclosed. Um, we don't have a massive, po we certainly have a population growth issue that we have to deal with. But I don't want to adopt Seattle's development code here. I'm, I'm fine with sticking where we're at. So I, I thank you for that. I, my pushback would be we are Seattle, Tacoma, state of Washington. Um, there's a lot of overlap in our development code. Centers and corridors is common across those three big cities. Just take those big cities, right? We all came from mostly the same planning, architecture, so for schools. So there's, a, there's a, absolutely a common thread. I'm not disagreeing and, and being disrespectful of that, but I, I think, yeah, I, of course, the local argument is we're not Seattle, we're not West, you know, we're Spokane, and I, I never understood what that meant because um, I, I feel like I'm Spokane. I've been here 12 years, but, um, but I'm just saying it from, a, <laughs> from, a, um, from kind of the technical, philosophical, so forth, you know, uh, approach to planning, I, I think we, we have really common problems and I think we're going to learn a lot from Tacoma in particular. I brought up Seattle because they've done thorough study, so it's not just saying, hey, I'm arguing for another point one, it's they've, they've actually analyzed this. Uh, we can point to um, literature or reports and they've also studied this ex um, significantly at University of Washington um, and came up with a really interesting way, I think this comes out in their new comprehensive plan, uh, periodic update, is how they're going to do a bonus structure. Um, and, and allow neighborhoods to have significant input on what those bonus structures look like, what are appropriate solutions in Finney Ridge versus Wallingford versus so forth. But consistently, that was a baseline of 0.5, just like us, across the city, and then a 0.2 bump on ADUs. And that was, that was my point. So, okay. But if there's not support, again, I, I won't push that. It's not, this is progress. <laughs> Okay, I'll leave it. Um, you, Mr. President? Yes, please, sorry. I'm not monitoring carefully. Um, can you help me understand from your perspective what the net difference would be? Oh, the actual analysis of that? Just briefly, yeah. No, but I mean, that's, that's a good exercise. I mean, yes, we could, we could do it, but I, no, not on, on the spot reverse engineer that. I mean, maybe I'd ask the question, okay. how did we get to point six? I mean, can anyone, can anyone kind of defend why point six and not point seven? I mean, maybe I'll throw that back to everyone. Yeah. Essentially, essentially that's, I think that's what I'm asking. Okay. Well, um, Sounds like we'll leave that. Um, ADU four wall and thank you wall and roof height increase. So dimensional standards of 17 foot top plate, 25 foot ridge. Commissioner Bank. Yeah, this has been another one that sort of I think falls into the same category of your recent question of of how did we land at 17 and and I understand how we landed at 17. It it feels a little bit arbitrarily limiting to me, given that we've got an overall height limit. Um, is it the end of the world? Is it something that's worth, 
for having a protracted conversation about. I don't really think so at this point, but just for the record, I, it feels a little arbitrary to me. Yeah, and I think I should clarify. I, when I'm asking these questions and, and trying to get this discussion in the public forum and deliberation, it's really to establish why. Is this a political equilibrium we could, we've come to? And I think that's where we are, quite frankly, on many of these, and which ones are technical, you know, because I and 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 to, and, and, and to support the planning department, these were presented, and I, my understanding is this will move forward to council, as this is where equilibrium landed right now at the plan commission level. But here are the you know two or three options that were always presented very fairly and didn't discuss, and 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 uh, so. And, and just as a point of clarification, I, th I think where I'm coming from on that is, you know, ultimately we're wanting to incentivize the construction of more ADUs. Do I honestly believe that 17 feet versus 20 feet is going to have a meaningful impact on that? I don't think so. It, you know, it, would it be nice maybe to have a little bit of extra flexibility there? Totally. Yeah. But I, I think this is something that it's, we've hit that equilibrium point, we're likely to, to see this realized and then we can have data and we can look at it and maybe there is a problem, maybe there isn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't think we're gonna get past this right now. I, I would support that just the underlying dimensional standards for the whole lot should be applied, not any special for a building type, but um, I'm trying to think where else in the code well, single family has the same wall and peak height. They're different numbers, yeah. but they use that same control. And that's what I'm arguing. Yeah. Is shouldn't it just, yeah. in the future, we should explore that the, that's the- And then the, garage accessories have different Have ones. different, yeah. Ex exactly. So I think those are the only places that it- But we, where else do we say by building typology we have different dimensional standards? Do we do, uh, maybe we do. Maybe, do we do it in cottage? I know we're opening up a lot here, but- I don't remember that those do. We do, we have different dimensional standards for cottage housing, okay. So maybe that's that's the answer, then it's, there's precedent for it, yeah. Um, I do, 17, we're, I'm not gonna propose that we change it, but 17 does not get us, uh, regardless of what your taste in architecture is, it doesn't get us to a nine foot box plus on, with an eight foot box on top, so it's, or I mean with a, with a I'm sorry, a 10 foot yeah. floor to floor, the bottom floor, and then a, a nine, eight or nine foot ceiling above. So we're just short of that. So it's it's gonna be a, a pony wall at some level. I do appreciate the, the 25 foot peak increase though, because it does allow for a lot more like book plans to be used. Um, a lot of those ones that are sold by like plan, you know, plan, you know, like 600 bucks, 900 bucks and get the plans those exceeded the existing 23 foot and it really limited people's options for you know getting an off the shelf plan so yeah um, yeah I, I do think that that's an important increase the the whole gable roof thing in spokane though I and mean, people love themselves a gable roof <laughs> gables can be nice but i, I hear yeah, you yeah. <laughs> okay okay i'm not hearing any any desire or appetite to change that. Okay, ADU 5, ADU 6, require owner occupancy of short-term rent on lot. I'll, I'll just state that this is a political discussion and it's best dealt with at the council in my opinion. Um, I get it, it's in Title 17, so therefore we're, we're talking about it, but I think from a technical standpoint, I, from a technical planning and or architecture standpoint, it's not, I, I don't really support it, but it doesn't, it's gonna be a council decision on what their appetite is. I mean, anyone have a other strong opinion? We've talked about it a lot in the workshop. I get it. Commissioner Francis. Well, my only comment about it is, to me, housing is housing. I would like it to not be short term, but you know, I'm more free market in that range. So, but I'm not gonna propose changing it because like you said, it's, there's an element of it that's political that um, short-term rentals are a major issue in most residential area, or most areas right now and they're causing a huge impact on housing. As much as I'd like not to put this requirement in, I think it's gonna be a necessary one for it to move forward. Uh, agreed, for sure. Um, the covenant thing still gives me a great deal of indigestion. Um, I, I know that's 
baked into the code elsewhere, and that's sort of outside of the purview of this conversation, but for the record, I, I, I have a real, real issue with making these kinds of sort of transitory land use decisions where something could change down the road, but all of a sudden you got a covenant on the books, and I don't know if anyone here has dealt with trying to get rid of a covenant, but it's not easy. And you could have some sort of state law that could come in and supersede our state law, but you still got that covenant on the books, and you still got to deal with it, and it's, it's an extra hamstring that I really have a lot of indigestion about, but again, outside of the purview of this conversation, just wanted to get that out there. Can I just add really fast? Um, the section that talks about the covenant is actually within the accessory dwelling unit code, okay. and there is uh, amended language already touching that section. So I wouldn't say that it's outside the purview. If you look on page A16 at the bottom, that's where that's where it is. No, I, I, I had that open, but then I asked the, the clarifying question to Nate about that sort of uh, applying to, applying outside of ADUs as well. Is that correct, Nate? No, that's only, uh, the, the covenant thing is specifically in the ADU code, and that's how. I think it was more that it was existing in the So, ADU. yeah, the, gotcha. the existing that's code right. requires a covenant under all cases. Right. The change that's proposed is that that would only be applied if you want to operate a short-term rental. Short -term rental yeah. Commissioner Neely? I would support the contention that this is something that gives a lot of members on this commission heartburn, but it, I, it is surely political and probably not worth a whole lot more discussion because it's going to be decided at the city council level. Commissioner Francis. Well, I'm wondering about the possibility, you know, in the code, it says occupancy for short-term rentals. I'm, I'm wondering if we just strike the putting in the covenant and then basically that leaves it up to code enforcement. How um, to enforce? you know, Office of Code Enforcement or whatever to enforce it. So if, you know, if someone's not complying, then they come back and, you know, so just strike it from the covenant. From the ADU code? Right. Just Is strike the saying? word covenant. Well, just strike a yeah, uh, section B. requirement. Yeah. yeah, you're talking about subsection B of 17C300-120? Yeah. Okay. Why, why add it to the covenant at all? Because I know that's a means of enforcement, but you have an alternative means of enforcement through standard code enforcement practice. And through the license. Yeah. The Which is up license. for discussion. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Well, and they could revive. Yeah. Right. You know, they're going to be yeah. doing a short-term rental code update anyway right. for the licensing. So maybe they can enforce it through that. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. I was kind of hoping that it could get wrapped up into that other, you know, side. Yeah. And again, we're advisory, so if that's, if our message to council is from a technical standpoint that we don't feel that's necessary, they're going to deal with it anyway. So. Okay. Oh, I was just going to, I think the argument could be made, you know, if, if there's questions on to why we want to strike that, that um, we don't want to restrict housing options given potential changes down the road at the state level. Commissioner Francis. If you are open to an amendment, I'm willing to make an amendment. I don't think there is an amendment. Is there? Huh? He wants to make one. I don't make think one. we have. No, I'm going to propose an no, amendment. No, oh, okay. No okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'd like to propose an amendment to the original motion to strike 17C.300.120, uh, item B, the section on covenants. Could you clarify him before a second here? 17B, I mean, so that, that B is already in there. It's the red, if you're looking at, see right here? No, I want to strike so th the whole section, item B. The red is the amended language that would apply only to short-term rentals. I believe, Commissioner Francis, what you're suggesting is that the entire section could go. Correct. Okay. Second. Okay, yeah. moved and seconded. Um, Commissioner Francis, Commissioner. So, so the impact of this. Right. <laughs> would basically, it, it doesn't change the rules with regards to short-term rentals. Short-term rentals are still required by the code up above. Okay, that's what I just wanted to make sure. All this does is eliminates the need to log it in the covenant. Yep. Yeah. Because it's in the occupancy section that limits Correct. the short-term yeah. rental. Okay. Right. 
Yeah, so I think, you know, as long as there's that control to address the, the political issue and the, the sort of uncomfortableness about short-term rentals and owner occupancy, I, I support that. Okay. Okay, so the, um, no other discussion. So the amendment at hand is, is to strike 17C 300-120 section B. Um, can we do a, a voice vote, try a voice vote? All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Abstentions? Okay, so amendment is adopted. Back to Mr. the main. President. Go ahead, please. All right, I, um, I'm going to abstain on that one. You're, okay, so, so one abstention, Commissioner Neely, thank you. Um, okay, so back to the main motion now. Um, my, what my, my last comment would be I do think this gets preempted at some point, so I think that's a, a, a valuable move. The request from a technical side, which I don't know if it happens before council, would be, to me, this is also one for development feasibility, that why would, why would this, how does this incentivize why someone would do this? So again, that's complicated, but clearly people want to build ADUs for the additional revenue so that can support their ability to own their home, their property, so forth. Like that's part of, or that's a, re a reality for many people to own a home, is to have additional revenue from that dwelling unit. So, but we don't have that information as part of this, this study. So, okay. Anything else on that one? ADU seven, uh, one okay parking, right? One space for two bedrooms, one space per additional bedrooms. I'd like to see it all go away. Uh, okay, let me give basis for that. It's not a political comment. Um, I, I need help understanding why we add a space without, and, and correct me if there is consideration for what is already there in that property. How is, am I not understanding correctly that, what if there are already 18 parking spots on a 12,000 square foot lot, why, why are we gonna just, prescriptively require one more space or there is there easy pathways is that not correct my assumption my assumption and other easy easy pathways I, to get out wouldn't of you be allowed to use one of those off street parking spaces to yeah. fulfill this yeah so the way that that's applied is we we are evaluating the minimum re parking required based on the total development on the so lot if, so if you have excess parking okay. and build an adu and need a parking space you can use that excess parking. okay so that's not a good argument so thank you <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really had that question. I didn't. I didn't know. Try yeah. again. <laughs> so, no, no, no. I, I appreciate that, but I'm not. That wasn't a political. I, I, I really just trying to. No, it, it's. So it's not added. Sorry. Go ahead. It's not additive to your 18 parking spaces. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Presses. You know, I would. I would like to strike all parking requirements, but the reality of our development, unfortunately, is that we are a very car-oriented society, still. As much as I'd like to say that's not the case, I'm, it's, it's not gonna change. And so I think we've made a good compromise here by allowing studio and one-bedroom apartments no parking requirement, which is a good, good, good change. But as soon as you start to get into two or three bedrooms, there is gonna be a definite need for parking. And, you know, there's only gonna be so much that can be accommodated on street. So um, I think this was a good compromise. And as much as I'd like to see parking requirements eliminated, I think, I think we gotta strike a balance here. Mr. Patterson. So I figured out how you get, away, get rid of your parking requirements. We just have to increase transit to the majority of our city that has under 15 minute intervals. Thank you. Exactly. I'm, I, I'm excited for that. Yeah, I, okay. Well, we'll let it go. I, I just, I struggle with this as being good planning. I think this is all political and I don't. I will just say I have, I ride transit every day. I'm in that 15, you know, in that quarter mile from a high performance transit and I still have three vehicles. That's stupid me. <laughs> Think of all that money you're wasting on insurance. Tires. Yes, I agree. Tell my wife. 
<laughs> okay, I, I don't hear appetite for changing that. So um, ADU 8, allow an ADU with duplex, triplex, et cetera, and RFT, RMF, and RHD. I think that one's fairly straightforward and pretty bound by the concerns about the um, going over three units, right? Is that, is that correct? That's what I understood from the workshop. But the three unit, sorry, I, I missed what you were saying. Um, Ms. Beck, it, I, don't know if we, I don't know if we need to rehash this, but we, you had talked about your, uh, when going through this process, you, um, you ran into, in these zones, potentially going over three units. Am I understanding this correctly? There's other considerations. Yeah. So when we went back and spoke with building and fire personnel, um, it's not the building code that would look at that as an additional unit and kicking into commercial, it's the fire code. So that third unit would require um, likely a commercial review regardless of whether it's attached or detached. The third unit would or above third unit? So the, let me make sure I get this right <laughs> because that is splitting hairs but yeah. it is very um, important. So having three units oh. so when you go above a dupl so if you had a duplex and mm -hmm. you added an adu by the fire code then you would kick into commercial okay which is why we added that additional language about applicable building and fire code still applying right but i do think it's important to address i like that we have because as we know the future of other housing changes um we we want to offer the flexibility and if someone wants to do it, they do just have to apply commercial building standards to the, all the units. Correct, then, and that's yeah. why we added in that new ADU 8, so it yeah. allows that flexibility for the additional missing middle housing types. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's the end of the list. Are we ready to uh, vote on the main, amend, main motion? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 622. Uh, okay, thank you. Let's uh, take roll call, please. Jesse Bank. Aye. Todd Byrother. Aye. Greg Francis. Aye. Chris Neely. Aye. Ryan Patterson. Aye. Tim Williams. Aye. Clifford Winger. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, uh, moving on to the second item, lot size. Uh, oh, well, by the way, everyone's okay? <laughs> I think we can probably move through. Yeah. Can we take a five minute break? We can. Is that okay? Oh, sure. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That would help me. Go over quick. Okay, we're just. Almost done. We are, we are. We'll just be at ease for. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> like. Prolong it a little yeah, that was a big one. We're at ease for five minutes, so I'll, I'll just hey, say 628. We quick on the other
Okay, thank you. We're back from short. We make a motion to adopt this. Short uh, recess. Uh, so Spokane and Planning Commission, we're back on in our hearing. Um, we're moving on to our second item in the in the second hearing um, package. Uh, this is a uh, lot size. So let's can we hear a motion, please. I move to recommend that City Council adopt the changes to the lot size transitions code in the SMC section 17C.110.200 as written and presented. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, Commissioner Francis, Commissioner Banks. Uh, okay, deliberation. Commissioner Francis. This is a good change. <laughs> Let's do it. Agreed. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone oppose it in deliberation? Okay. Uh, if we're ready, then we'll just move into roll call. Thank you. All right. Jesse Bank. Aye. Todd Byrother. Aye. Greg Francis. Aye. Chris Neely. It's unavailable. At the moment, Ryan Patterson. Aye. Tim Williams. Aye. Clifford Winger. Aye. All right, motion carries. Okay, thank you. Um, and third item, <coughs> Could we hear a motion, please. I move to recommend that City Council adopt the changes to the short plat notification process in SMC chapters 17G.060 and 17G.080 as written and presented. Thank you. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Commissioner Francis, Commissioner Banks, uh, deliberation on short plots. Is this where we're, this, we want to talk about the me? notification? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. This Mary, this, this oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, we, Mary, this is perfect now, time to be recognized. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. you're scooting to the end. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. That's, that's what we, we discussed, so thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, um, as I stated before, um, I, I think the neighborhoods are, are great. Um, appreciative of the fact that they're because I don't think people from 2015 are necessarily the people that are on the neighborhood councils now uh, and um, I'm not sure that they, everybody knew that they were part of the agency list however um, I do know how age, the neighborhood councils run and some of them meet quarterly some of them meet have have months where they don't meet a 15 day notice and to try and put together some sort of committee and get uh, accumulate the comments and get them back in a single document in 15 days is just really not workable so if it and I don't know if it's if it's okay to leave it as is and just know from the city perspective that um, the neighborhood council chairs it's up to them to uh, send out that um, any short plat notice to the neighborhoods and uh, allow the neighborhoods uh, to individually comment then we're fine. But if it needs to be a collective um, comment that comes back from the neighborhood council, I don't think that's possible to do. So I guess I, I, yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll just comment on the procedure there. Um, I don't believe there's anything in code that would, I, I mean, there's nothing that dictates that the current planners when they're gathering that information uh, have to ignore comments that come from the neighborhood that weren't aggregated to the neighborhood council level. Yeah. Um, that's sort of a best practice and they've asked the neighborhoods to adhere to that just like any of the other agencies that they work with. Um, but they, uh, and I think Donna um, DeBee said this yeah. in the meeting at the community assembly, they would not ignore a comment that came in from an individual who received the notice through the neighborhood council well, system. I, I, get, I heard that and I, that gave me some comfort, but I think the, uh, the more likely than not from the neighborhood councils, it will be coming in from individuals because it just, the timelines don't work and, and most, a lot of the neighborhood councils don't have particular committees that are set up just to pull comments for, uh, uh, for the, couple times or whenever it is that it might come in I mean we just had one um, and we're almost uh, you know there's 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 homes on most every piece of property but uh, we had one and I didn't even know that it was not the preferred thing I just sent it out to the and said please comment if you wish to and there may have been no comments because it wasn't a particularly contentious one but um, I just don't want there to be some sort of pushback later on saying you neighborhood councils are not doing this appropriately because it's just really not possible. Uh, those of us who are chairs and have been for a number of years work pretty consistently and 
put in a lot of hours as it is, and I don't know how we would do that. So I so that if that's the understanding, uh, then I'm good with that, and I can relay that to the neighborhood councils. I'll just add, um, I think in terms of the aggregation of those comments, it does not have to be, um, that, that doesn't have to be done in a, in a meeting where you discuss a unified voice for the neighborhood. I think it can be as simple as receiving uh, like emails, for example, from interested residents and then just putting them all into one email. Well, I, I, but again, I, I think the current I, planning department would uh, would receive emails from anybody and would not yeah. ignore them just because they didn't come from the council. Well, I'm not even sure how possible that is. Some of us don't even have good distribution lists. I, we're, we've just started to build ours and I uh, depend a lot on neighbor, uh, next door to send stuff out and to try and aggregate what comes out of next door. I just, I don't think it's, it's, it, it's not like other agencies. Um, the neighborhood councils don't operate that way uh, or some don't. Commissioner Francis. Um, I'm a neighborhood council officer. I've processed uh, short plat <coughs> notifications and other notifications. Um, the whole purpose of this changing the short plat notification process is to simplify it and to facilitate utilization of those plats and to make the process less expensive for just doing a simple lot split, that sort of thing. I get that the neighborhood councils are not necessarily organized around the communication um, and the whole purpose of that notification process as it was adopted, because I, I remember I was on council, or not council, but I was on planning commission when that was adopted, um, was to really give neighborhoods standing um, if they wanted to challenge something. And in order to have standing, they're gonna have to speak with a unified voice. If they don't speak with a unified voice, they're not gonna have standing. Um, so it really requires a neighborhood to speak together and however that's done. That said, I'm, I think that the short plat is just one of the many processes that could trigger neighborhood notification. Um, and I think that if uh, neighborhoods want to be able to respond to it, they're going to have to improve their communication methods. Um, I, I understand you, your challenges. You do, you do not, don't have the authority to ask that of the neighborhoods. He, well, asking. then the neighborhoods don't get an opportunity what? to respond. This is only on short plats. Right, it's only on short plats. On larger issues where there's been developments, the neighborhoods have come together because it's been a larger issue. And I recognize that, and there's no change to that process. Correct. Those just, neighborhoods still have full opportunity to respond to any other notice. They have not, the opportunity to respond to this. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about short plats. Right, and they have an opportunity to respond within a 14-day time frame, just like every other agency. Fine. I, it's, it can't That's, happen. It just can't happen. I, at, at, some aren't organized that way. They just aren't. And they don't even meet. And if... Uh, <laughs> I mean, that means I have to read my email when I'm on vacation because it could happen while I'm on vacation. So it's hard enough as it is, and it's tough enough to get volunteers. So uh, we can only do what we can do. And I fully understand that. But if there's an active interest to oppose a short plat, then it's up to the neighborhood council to mobilize to do that. Mr. And Patterson? specifically on this one, the agency, you know, that, I mean, I guess it applies to all short plats under nine for agency review, but the, the limit of the mailed review is, or the mail review still, the other notices apply for lots over three. And so this concern is mostly over very small. Correct. Like, so, so I guess I'm wondering is that, are there really that, mu that much potential opposition to one lot being turned into two lots that neighborhoods together need 
if you no. are going to need to have a say. I just want to clarify that the current proposal actually does not, it uses the, the limit in state statute of nine total lots. So that's the definition of a short plat, nine lots or, or fewer. Right. So it doesn't actually limit it. Uh, you, you, I think you used the number three, but there's not actually a number in there that it um, uses. Well, that was, I guess that's for the minor engineering review. The, and that's where the, the, number, the other notifications don't There's not apply. a number in the minor engineering review oh. either. That was in the draft from last week, but the feedback we got was that there didn't need so to be. So that was eliminated. So that's not in this current I think we talked about proposal. that. I just forgot. And that, that's why we did that, because okay. we talked about it in the last workshop. It's but good to clarify that, though. The, the, the way it was presented, it was no notice when it was two. And then you, and then it was explained that no notice still meant that the that the neighborhood councils would get notice as part of the agency. So that wasn't really no notice. It was no, it was noticed through the agency, and that's where, and that was on two. So the agency notice applies across the board. I get that. Always notice. In the early drafts, there had been an attempt to use two lots as a um, what's the word? Um, a proxy for these low impact subdivisions. Mm -hmm. And then in the last plan commission workshop where we talked about the minor engineering review, we included that two lot threshold. And the discussion was that we could remove the two lot threshold and instead rely on the fact that you're not creating new right of way or extending public utilities and that that alone would be sufficient. So it could be more than two. So it could you be. Know, it could be four. Now, in reality, the situations where you would find a, for example, an eight lot short plat where you're not extending right of way are, I mean, I don't even know that you could ever find a situation like that. So it naturally limits it anyway. But if you could theoretically find a situation where you could divide into eight lots and you're not creating new roads or extending right of or extending utilities then you would meet the definition of the minor engineering review and be subject to those okay. requirements so, so it could be more my, than two. yeah so my comment is yeah moved a bit no but helped helped explain it further right. yeah. commissioner neely um i sit on the south gate neighborhood council and i'm an alternate to the ca um with all respect, you can't leave this up to the neighborhood councils. Many of them simply do not meet. That's right. How could it work? So thank you for that. And my, if I understand this correctly, agency notice, right, that's across the board as stated, but it's not required that agencies respond, right? This is a dissemination method that, hey, the fire department and so forth, right? And it's up to that agency then to determine what they do with that and whether they want to respond. Is that correct? That's right. And so in that, absolutely hear the concern, but it's really not the, it shouldn't be the concern of, of, of this process, whether or not that agency, if, if, if the neighborhoods want to be recognized or have that, you know, the the status of an agency in, in these kind of matters, and it's really upon them to then what they do with that responsibility. Because I, I'm not saying I'm speaking just to you, obviously, Mary. Yeah, just, yeah. I, I'm, I'm just to, I'm just saying for small councils yeah. where one person plus maybe somebody else helping does the work, and I spend about 20 hours a week on it. I can't do anymore, and I'm trying to get another, this is just me, but it's, I know there's others like that who are trying to hand it off to another volunteer and to tell them what all is involved. I've been doing interim for five years because mm. I can't get anybody else to do it. So I don't want to say that they also have to gather all this documentation and put it together and send it to the city. Um, it, 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 we're just not gonna get anybody to help. Absolutely sympathetic to that, and then I hope my comment didn't yeah. come across that otherwise. But um, you know, it just raises the bigger question of whether they, the, you know, if, if if the elevation of that status is that the appropriate meth method or not. But it's there, it, right? It, it's there, and in some cases, and uh, there have been neighborhoods that have banded together because it's been a larger issue, and and then they did do something, and they even 
started to uh, buy their own director and officer insurance because they started to work on things and, and particularly were opposed. That's different than short plats and and I, I, I just think that, that the as long as the city's okay with the fact that it may not come in in the most in the best practice, then I'm good. No, but I'm it, I don't want uh, I don't want it to look like we aren't paying attention when I do send it out and distribute it and say please get back. And I'm I'm not even sure anybody got back. But yeah. I can't put another thing on people to do. Understood. And Commissioner, Patterson. I was just going to say I think also. The f I think we mostly can agree that the plan commission is going to receive public comment and accept all public comment regardless of, you know, who it came through. Um, and so that does seem to address Mary's concern. The other concern is just that the neighborhood, the people who live in the neighborhood might not have an opportunity to be notified and heard. And we did ask about other electronic notifications or postings. Um, I do think that that could potentially be improved. I mean, I don't think we need big signs in the, you know, but it, if there was a place for people to go to easily find these things, you know, newspapers are gone. So, I mean, that leaves us the internet. So um, there could still be some concern over just posting of notice and that could probably be improved. but. I don't know the mechanism that that could happen. And I think that would address the concerns of the people who say that they wouldn't be notified um, in order to give comment. Mr. Francis. Uh, I agree that I think, I think one of the important things is that people have the opportunity to get the information if they need it. Um, the, the system that I asked about, I utilize that it's been sporadic lately. Yeah. Um, either that or we're not doing any development anymore um, because I'll get them noticed once every three days and I follow the citywide. Um, so it, it's been very problematic um, and I'd like to see that improved. It is a mechanism, you have to know about it. Unfortunately, it is not clear um, and I would love to see that better exposed uh, on the city's website. Um, I think it would be great to have them posted on the web website that says here are the existing short plat notices. Um, I think we need to be better at public communication. At the same time, I think it's important to be able to expedite simplified yes. processes like a short plat. And so I'm going to support this because I think that's important, but I think the city has a responsibility to do a better job of making changes available and in a simplified way to re accomplish without driving up the cost to the developers. So yeah. anyway, I'm gonna support it. Let's go Commissioner, Commissioner Winger and then. Uh, can uh, Commissioner Francis's uh, thing be put into the notes going to city council? Like a recommendation? With, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, better communication, I concur with that. Uh, well, let, let's let's talk about that. Do we need a formal action to agree that that goes into findings of fact? I guess unless anyone's opposed, we we, we could just simply, as as um, Director Gardner is taking notes here. What are your thoughts? Uh, I I was just taking notes for that purpose. So, so you can incorporate. So I that. can make sure that's communicated that there is a desire to have better communication tools for short plats generally. Okay. Okay, okay. and I'll look for it. When, when I approve the findings of fact. Okay. That's the mechanism to check that. Yeah. Thank okay, thank you. Um, go ahead. I was gonna call the question, which is, if I remember Robert's Rules of Order, so I can <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. It's not eight yet. Read the cheat sheet. Okay, so um, if my understanding of Robert's Rules, then it would, someone would have to make a motion to oppose that and we'd have to have super majority? I don't remember. So anyone opposed, first of all? If not, okay. We'll take roll call then, please. This is on the main motion for the short flat recommendation. All right, Jesse Bank. Aye. Todd Byrother. Aye. Greg Francis. Aye. Chris Neely. Nay. All right, Ryan Patterson. Aye. Tim Williams. Aye. Clifford Winger. Aye. All right, motion carries. 
Okay, go ahead, yes. <laughs> and before we leave, I do have one other motion. I'm sorry, but this is a quick one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no debate required. I move to recommend that Plan Commission incorporate the May 4th staff report regarding ADUs, lot size transitions, and short plats into its facts and findings in recognition of the staff report's role in the Plan Commission's recommendations. Second. second. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded, um, Commissioner Francis, and then we'll go with um, Commissioner Neely. Um, my question to staff, though, is that what you want? And that was requested in the report. Okay, thank you. I, don't, I, just, um, I, I Yeah, but are there going to be amendments to that based off this, or the staff reports is is memorialized, is locked? This is better. Spencer can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the staff report would go as it was presented in your okay. um, packet, and then the amendments would reflect the changes to the draft text based on discussion and motions tonight, and then also um, Commissioner Francis's discussion in regard to better citywide communication on those permits as a part of the plan commission findings and recommendation okay. document. So it's already locked document, we're not restricting you. Right, the, the staff okay. report will go as it is. Okay, all right, any deliberation, thank you. Okay, hearing none, I'll, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Neely. No. Not on this. Okay. Okay, um, then let's take roll, please, on that motion. Jesse Bank. Aye. Todd Byrather. Aye. Greg Francis. Aye. Chris Neely. Aye. Thank you. Ryan Patterson. Aye. Tim Williams. Aye. And Clifford Winger. Aye. All right, motion carries. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to add one quick thing before we adjourn. Uh, I'm sure you all realize this, but I want to recognize how much work has been put into this. Um, Amanda's still here. Nate had to leave. Um, this is a tremendous amount of work, and I'm just really appreciative of um, no all the work here, they've here. done. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. I want to recognize um, Commissioner uh, Neely. Do you have a comment? He just took my script. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in the five months I've been on this, on this commission, I have been consistently impressed by the overall quality of the work that the, the city has done, the people they brought to, before this commission. They've just done yeoman's work straight across the board. I think we're all in agreement on that, so thank you. Okay, with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all. As everyone runs. <laughs> Are we glad we're done with ADUs now, though? Oh, man. Now we can